This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Well, good afternoon everybody and welcome aboard once again for another Sunset Safari. We're coming to you live from the Torchwood Concession in the Greater Cougar National Park of South Africa. My name is Ralph Kirsten and on the camera I've got Davi today as my wingman helping me to uh, navigate this area which is totally new for me. So I'm very excited. I'm going to be heading on into new landscapes and I can't wait. Now this afternoon we've also got Taylor out on foot also very exciting and James will be heading out with the vehicle as well. We're, we're sitting at uh, around about 26 degrees Celsius, uh, sort of around that 75 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's a lovely warm afternoon and I'm hoping that we can catch up with some lions um, but we will look for everything we can and it will be very exciting. So that is what the plan is for this afternoon. Please don't forget to send us your questions and your comments on the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter and on the YouTube live chat and get involved in the largest game drive in the world. Now, this is all just so new to me. Um, I've just crossed the boundary out of Juma, so I am totally stoked and I am ready to rumble. I hope you all are too, and please send us all your requests of what you would like us to be finding today, because um, I think we're going to get lucky. So, let's start up and let's head on down the road. And we'll head towards First Rocks, which is um, where there has been some lions. They like to hang out in that area. And while we drive on down the road, I hear that Taylor has found something that likes to fly around. <laughs> that was so funny. Ferg and I were just admiring the sound of a virtual starling as it flew on by. And then our eastern scarlet butterfly flew away. My name is Taylor McCurdy and on camera with me is, as I said earlier, is Ferg. And uh, well, we've been having no luck since this morning on safari. So I'm really looking forward to the bushwalk this afternoon. Herbie, of course, is down the way, just being shaded by a tree at the moment as he waits for us to move on from our butterfly, which we will do now because it has disappeared. <laughs> so I have to tell you, if you didn't watch the sunrise safari, my day started off like that, where everything I tried to put on camera, it would just magically vanish. Birds, animals, it was terrible. Anyway, so we're going to try and not have an afternoon like that. Because, oh, watch out for the bird. Literally, watch out for the bird. Hey, for, <laughs> sometimes those hornbills dive down so low, you end up ducking. I know they do that in camp when they go from tree to tree. And then they bang the disco ball that's hanging from a bush willow tree. Right, anyways, let's go and see some wildlife. And James has got a kudu. We've got so much wildlife over here, Sunday wildlife over here, a whole lot of kudus, so many of them. There is one, we've probably got four here. I've decided that I am going to sing this whole safari. Don't worry, I'm not, I'm not going to sing the whole safari, everybody. Hello. I hope you're having a lovely afternoon wherever you happen to be in the world. My name is James Henry. On camera today we have got Craig. Zamat. That was his very speedy thumb going past the front of the lens, not a fly. Please talk to us using the hashtag for Alive and of course the chat stream on YouTube. That is all the housekeeping I have to do today. I don't need to tell you where the loos are because you are in your own homes and therefore I don't need to tell you that sort of thing or not stand up on the back of the vehicle because you can stand up as many times as you like. <gasps> Look at this kudu running across the road. There's actually a huge herd of about, I mean, a huge herd of kudu, which is not necessarily a huge herd per se. There are about ten of them here. Let me just go forward a little bit. Some of them the other side of the river, some of them this side. River, road, I meant. There we go. They are very secretive, normally, and they also, they tend to panic quite easily. 
which means that seldom will they stand still for very long. This guy thinks we can't see him, you see. Or she thinks we can't see her. I've decided that my favourite feature of the kudu is that sort of white clown's lipstick that they wear. And there's another one over here, Craig. Oh, here they are, they're running. There we go. Another one coming. Little baby. That was very nice. That was a world-class kudu sighting, I'd say. Let's continue. My plan this afternoon is to head down towards sort of treehouse, waterhole, chelapan, and those two waterholes are in the south western central areas of Juma and then maybe we'll pop down to Chitwa a little bit later. The reason for that is there was there were tracks of female leopards going down here some from some time yesterday evening. We didn't find them until right at the end of the bushwalk so we're not really sure where they went. And they're not particularly fresh, but we're going to head down that way and see if we don't cover somewhere that wasn't covered in the vehicle this afternoon. And maybe the leopardess has decided to come and have something to drink at one of the pans. That would be very nice. We think possibly Shidulu, our four-year-old new friend. But we aren't sure. We don't really know. This road, which is called Philemon's Dip, is now kind of a boundary, I guess, between shadows, not shadows, um, Chidulu's territory and Tundi's territory. Shadow's territory is now in the ether, we think. There's a bird, Craig, it's shouting. It is a crested barbet. It's on the bottom right-hand side of that rather dead-looking knob thorn tree. That's the one. There they are, there are two of them shouting at each other. They keep calling throughout the winter, you know. They're not migrants, obviously, because they're still here. But many birds will go silent in the winter months. And these chaps seem to keep going. And I remember this from when I lived in Johannesburg and they were one of the few bird species that came to the garden. There were actually quite a few bird species, but they were one of the more colorful ones. And you'd hear their call throughout the winter. Often if you put out a piece of pawpaw or something in the morning, that's a pepino to the rest of the world. Then they'd come and fight over it, shout at each other. With that kind of startled and irritated look that remains on their faces all the time. This one's running out of steam for his calling. That's very funny. I know the colours aren't great on this particular picture, through no one's fault but there are some lovely yellows and oranges and reds and blacks and whites formed by melanins and keratins not keratins why do i always say keratins carotenoids is what i mean those are the pigments that make the yellows reds and oranges very nice let us turn right here along Philemon's Cutline Road, down towards Treehouse Waterhole. Marvellous. Now, the next thing that Taylor's going to show you will hopefully not fly away like the first thing that Taylor tried to show you. Is a tree, and this young leadwood is not going anywhere, well, not any time soon. I suppose if an elephant came around and maybe tried to feed on it, Although, do you not actually ever see elephants eating leadwood leaves? What do they taste like? I don't think they... Oh, sorry. <laughs> I thought that was not as strong as I thought it was going to be. Sorry, Ferg. Not very nice. Don't like... Mm, just tastes very leafy. Like standard leaf. Anyway, so it's not very nice. But 
I always find it unusual when I see leadwood trees, and especially when they're so small like this, because it often tricks me. When you look at the bark of this leadwood, you think to yourself, but that doesn't look anything like the big ones that grow along the drainage lines and the rivers. Look how smooth it is. Whereas on the big trees, when they stand taller than 10 meters, that outer layer of bark gets quite hard, hard and um, <clears throat> forms these amazing ridges, and it's a lovely wood to sort of look at. And it's also a lovely wood to burn. Good luck trying to cut it down, being so tough. Now, huh, Ferg and I are already feeling defeated today because, well, the butterflies and, and insects are, of course, warmed up, unlike they were this morning and, and have been flying around, which is, I think, what's happened with our eastern scarlet that we had earlier. And I'm sad I didn't bring a butterfly book with me because there's so many of them around today, which is really nice. We'll try and put a couple on when we can and if they sit still for long enough. But there's something else that I just noticed down on the ground. And it's these yellow fruits that caught my attention. Now, looking at that, I'm thinking, where did that come from? Immediately, I looked up to see if it was from above, but it isn't. Let me move that. <sighs> Got to be careful when I move this one, because the plant that I actually ended up just moving is what produced these fruits. Now, Kirsty says they look like little apricots. Well, that's what they look like when they're ripe. And then have a look. Come look, at, look at what they look like when they're not ripe. Let me try and get it down there. It's pretty the can't angle it nicely with the sun. Completely different. This looks like a little watermelon. Because <laughs> this also just exclaimed a baby watermelon. So these are not edible to you and I. This is the poison apple or the chiff apple. And you'd be careful because it does have little thorns along here that like to grab you. Vincent, let me show you the ones over there. You see that? Tiny little thorn. So you actually don't even see it. But it's very prickly, very, very sharp. So you've got to be very careful of them. It looks like something was eating the fruit. Maybe an insect of sorts. Maybe a bird pecked at it. Remember, animals' digestive systems are completely different. And how's that cursed? Not the seed of an apricot, but the seed of tomato. Well, it looks like tomato seeds. Very cool. And mystery fruit, hey? This could confuse someone. But very cool to see. Anyways, it doesn't look like as much of the seeds have been fe uh, feasted upon. I don't know how much flesh this fruit really has to it. I'm going to open up another one and have a look. It doesn't look like it's got much at all. Oh, but I'm sure it'll be ooh, the birds or something that will be dispersing that. Hmm. Very nice. Now I'm going to get the feeling back in my foot. Pins and needles. That's always a fun one. All right, well, I'm not going to keep you for much longer because I'm going to send you to Ralph now who is bumbling about on Torchwood. And bumbling we are indeed. I'm still just um, discovering the place and my first impression is is that um, there's quite a few nice open areas, a little bit of grassland, like Darvi can maybe just swing across here and just give you an idea. Um, nice open grass with quite a few silver cluster leaf thickets and then we've got these general drainage lines as well and I'm just moving through just going everywhere having a look for now um, obviously it's still very similar in terms of the kind of vegetation um, the kind of vegetation but as I say there's nice open areas and we've just come past first rock um, and I will go back there a little bit later uh, just to show you if you haven't seen it a nice open area almost uh, similar to that of um, the black rocks in the Maasai Mara quite a, a similar kind of scene there and of great potential for for elephants and lions when they're on top of those rocks. Now, Aaron, um, you can find some jackals in open areas like this. And like I've, I said, I think it was yesterday that actually I spotted a jackal in the dark. Um, I haven't seen many jackals in this uh, area of the Kruger Park at all. So I'm going to keep my eyes open, Aaron. Stop just for you. So we'll have a look for that, and yes, it is perfect kind of terrain for them, but I'm not quite sure why there's, no, why there's so few of them here, as well as the, the civets, because, um, you know, the tracks that I've found in, in areas just nearby to this particular part of the Kruger has um, a lot of civets, and they're probably the most common track, along with jackals, and yet in this particular area, they're few and far between. 
So it's, um, it's quite interesting to note, and I wonder why. It might be because of the, the number of leopards. You know, maybe maybe that's that's a good reason as to why there's so few of civet and jackal. Ali, um, I'm not holding my breath to spot any ostriches. Uh, obviously, there is potential. There could be the odd one, um, but you know, this part of the Kruger, it's not the the most ideal habitat for ostriches. Although there are some ostriches, being a very desert adapted animal, um, they do occur here, but not in in great numbers. So we've got the odd chance that we might spot one as well. But remember, we are bordering on Juma, so we can expect to to find very similar animals here as well. Slightly different terrain, obviously. We, you, we're in a different part of, um, uh, of this area, but it, it's, it's still leading into Juma and it's, and it's pretty much the same um, uh, in terms of the animals that we should find. But you never know, and I'm just gonna keep on looking around and see what fancy things that are hiding here in the bushes. They're very exciting. I love going into new areas, getting lost, I've got my map with me, just trying to um, find my way around. But uh, for now, I'm just going on whatever way I feel. I just say to Darby, when we get to a road, we say which way, right or left. And so as I continue trying to find my way around Torchwood, let's head you back to James, who I think is trying to find his way around Juma. Yes, after three and a half years, I'm able, at least three years, I am able to find my way around Juma. Thankfully, sort of. There is a Franklin, crested variety, as far as I'm aware. And apparently, it is my third anniversary here, not today, as Judy H. pointed out on, on Twitter, uh, my anniversary is on the 23rd. And last year I bemoaned the fact that none of you wished me a happy anniversary on the 20th. And Judy H. pointed out, of course, that I was being ridiculous because my... Well, I was being ridiculous anyway, but my anniversary is only on the 23rd of May. So that gives you all enough time to get a nice card in the post for me, perhaps a small bottle of apple juice, something of that nature, so that I might celebrate my anniversary. And a new hat. By the way, the new hat, and it is, there is, I told you there was one, has arrived. It is in Hootsprayt. It is at Steph's house. And with any luck, I'll have it before the end of the week. Along with a new shirt. This one is getting a little bit old. Kirsten says I'll have to do a fashion show. I'm afraid there's nothing about my wardrobe that could be described as fashion much as I like to think of it as fashion, I must be honest with myself. No, Kirsten, I can't wear my stripy shorts. They're in Kenton, where they belong. They're holiday shorts. I had bought some stripy shorts, everyone, and I tried to wear them on safari one day. And I was told in no uncertain terms by both Kirsten and Rebecca that they were not going to fly. My blue shorts have also been rejected by all, except some of you who quite like them. Well, so you and I are in agreement at least. There wasn't anything at Treehouse Waterhole except two terrapins which took fright and climbed into the water and swam away. So we've continued from there. We'll pop around to the little pans down here. This morning, of course, Hukumuri was coming out of or towards the boundary from Arethusa, so it might just be worth checking our eastern boundary to find, or western boundary, sorry, to find if his tracks haven't come across. But well, we're not going to spend a huge amount of time trying to track him, because tracking a leopard in the middle of the day is really very difficult. It's difficult at the best of times. And this odd weather persists when there's quite heavy sort of summerish grey clouds in the deep blue winter sky. And it's been a very pleasant day temperature-wise, though, so we shan't complain. We should be grateful. And the other thing I wanted to point out here, Craig, is if you would just pan the camera around, sort of in generally, is how fast 
suddenly all of the combretum leaves are changing from green to yellow to brown. I think it's happened in the last week. Suddenly they've switched off. Blink! And they've assumed their winter colours and obviously they're all going to drop off now. Leaving the wilderness with a gentle scent of potpourri. Very nice. Okay, on we go. Carl, um, I, I, I don't have many thoughts on the royal wedding. Uh, Harry's going bald, like me, that's good. Uh, well, yeah, probably not good for him, but he'll have to get over it. His brother's bald, his father's baldish. It's quite interesting. There's a squirrel. <laughs> it's, it's actually quite an interesting discussion. There's nothing to do with safari, of course, but that royal family... I once said to a chap, I was staying down in a towel at Fugitive's Drift Lodge on the battlefields, the Zulu battlefields, and I said, what is the point of the monarchy? I mean, it's just a ridiculous, outdated, crazy sort of thing. I mean, how in the 20th, in fact, by that stage, 21st century, can there be any point to it? And he explained to me that while it might not have any major leadership role to play in the country, economically, the royal family is worth masses to the United Kingdom. You see how many thousands of people want to go and see Buckingham Palace, how many millions of people around the world would have watched that royal wedding. They are a giant generator of income for the United Kingdom, which I found fascinating. So they don't just take a whole lot of taxes and kind of expect to live off the land. They actually seem to make a very enormous contribution to the UK's economy. All right, that's the last thing I have to say about them. Let's head on to the squirrels now. They're having a very pleasant Sunday afternoon frolic on this jackalberry tree. Looks like two adults. Pradeep, you are very happy to see squirrels. Well, good. I think they're very sweet. And if you can watch them for long enough, they're almost always doing something interesting. That is the tree squirrel, for those of you who don't know. Much smaller than the European grey squirrel. And the only squirrel species that we have in this particular area. A couple of squirrels in South Africa. Including the ground squirrel, which uses its tail as a parasol, which I think is rather amazing. Right, squirrels have disappeared. We are going to disappear. Taylor is about to appear. Well, maybe just to stick in some prints on the sand. And we've got some female leopard tracks, which is quite cool. So here's the pad, and here are the toes. Now, they don't look particularly fresh, but the ones we had just a moment ago up on the road are definitely from this morning. I think James may have showed you towards the end of uh, the bushwalk as he was coming up from Philemon Stip. So we think it could possibly be Shudulu on her way back from Elephant Plains, where she's been for the last 24 hours, the last two days or three days at least. So there's a possibility we may see her. So that's quite exciting. So we're going to try and stick on them. I'm trying to see where they go. I think they actually go all the way along here. And that's where Herbie's led us, is actually down this little mitre drain. And, well, I don't know where we're going to go next from here. I'm unfamiliar with Shirulu's roots. I mean, every time everyone's normally had her, it's been a little bit further to the west. And this is going towards Ingwe Alley, to, back towards Twin Dams, which we, we did see her once up top here at quarantine and she went down and her tracks went, I think, a little bit more east. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. And then... Something that Shidulu might eat is a scrub hair. And well, I suppose it is a little plant out here that sort of resembles the scrub hair's tail with much imagination. And that's this plant over here. This is called Hair Tails Bush. It's quite cool. It's quite a prickly plant as well. 
It's not very nice to sort of touch quite robust. I don't think anything really eats it. I can't say I've ever seen an elephant pull it out the ground and munch on it. Now, it's not a grass. It's actually, I think it might even be a herb. It's a bush, though. And you can see it's quite stemmy over here. You can see how the leaves are divided. But it doesn't look very nice. I can't, I can't say that I've ever read anything about it being poisonous. I just never really noticed any animals eating it. It doesn't also grow in abundance, though. You don't see much of it. You just see it popping up every now and then. Ah, very prickly. Okay, well, shall we catch up with Herbie? Let's keep going. So we're going to jump onto this, which kind of turns into an animal pathway, which is quite nice. Lots of thorns, though, lots of debris. I think that was brought in by the tractor, though. Although the elephants do favour this area, too. And... Well, lots of creatures do. It's not a particularly great area to walk in, as you can see. Look how thick it is. The grass is quite tall, so we're going to have to be quiet as we navigate through this area. Ralph, however, is at a much more open spot, and he seems to be up on a rock. Well, and we're on very big flat rocks here, it must be said. This here is called Second Rock. And this is the perfect site, I would say, for uh, finding predators in winter. I'm sure they'll come out here and bask in the sun with the rocks holding quite a bit of heat. And it's probably the perfect site uh, for sundowners, for guests as well. I would imagine that uh, the guys that move, move on this property do come through here and stop off for sundowners or a nice coffee break in the morning. But it's a lovely spot to look out as well. And we do see, as we start panning there, you will see off in the distance, there's the Drakensberg even starting. So it's a beautiful little site, this. We haven't seen too much in the way of animals just yet, but, uh, well, it's still early in the afternoon. I'm sure as it starts cooling down a little bit, we'll, uh, we'll get to see a little bit more, and then um, that's when I'm going to be uh, putting my concentration a little bit more onto finding uh, those predators uh, that we love to see. But for the time being, I'm just enjoying being here on Torchwood. We're in the north-central part, so uh, not... Um, but we haven't gone too far just yet, and just enjoying it. Indigo Girl, um, I like that you're asking about these rocks because um, it's probably quite fascinating in terms of the geological formations here. And this is all granite, uh, just by looking at it from here. Um, and it would obviously be very volcanic, so you've got... A very coarse sort of um, minerals within granite and it does make for quite sandy soils as well once it breaks down so all along the edges there in the fringes of this rock you'll have pioneer grass species because that's where you've got your first succession stage uh, starting to happen as these rocks weather and break down and then also next to it like there you'll see uh, plants like the red bush willow and also sickle bush and oh, there's one of those little butterflies. I don't know if that's a... I didn't see it well enough. I saw lots of white on it. I didn't see any of the other colors. You do see a lot, a lot of the orange tip, the whites, uh, at, this, at this moment in time. And it was quite a large butterfly, that, but I didn't see it long enough to be able to identify it. But there you can see some silver cluster leaf. In the background there's some marulas, and then there's all the general trees especially going down into the ravines you'll start to have some jackalberries and uh, they pretty much evergreen so one of the only trees that you'll see dark green at the moment um, but there are some sickle bushes and some sweet thorns down there and then uh, the rest of the trees starting to lose all of their leaves so very pretty and I think well the discovery of this new traverse it needs to continue. I'm very excited. Let's uh, let's head on out and see what else we can find. Very nice. I like this spot, and it's obviously with this with this flat rocks like this, it's a good site for animals to come and get a drink of water as well. Now, take care. I agree with you. Thanks for your comments. Such diverse. Um, 
vistas and and um, lovely area for us to find predators absolutely total agreement take care and lots of new space to get lost in and find little secret nooks and crannies i love it I love new areas it's like going uh, to the Maasai Mara for the first time Now, Joy from Hong Kong, um, I think we, we could be in with a good chance of us seeing a cheetah because of these open areas. I've, I've heard once before on the radio where the guys had said there's cheetah here on Torchwood. So that's since I've been here. So it's not necessary, uh, necessarily that we're going to see them all over the place, but there is a good chance of us finding some. So we'll just keep our eyes open and these kind of open areas are perfect habitat for them but uh, you know they do quite well also in the thickets um, but as I say since I've been here I haven't had any cheetah on Juma they were here on Torchwood so as my hunt continues for animals it seems James has beaten me to it Yes, we've thrashed you to it, absolutely mangled you beyond recognition to the finding of animals. To be fair, I knew they were here, though that's not really why I came down here. Those of you that is, are wondering, uh, that is a wildebeest, a young one, born probably in December this year. Not this year, we haven't had December this year, that's impossible. December last year, putting it at nearly six months old. Yes, see, turning to agree. And really, this herd, as I've said to you again and again, has done so well with the disappearance of the lions from this area. Oh, we've been charged, Craig. They're all massing to come towards us. That's very nice. Normally, they're just running away, frightened for some reason. And the light's really quite pretty at the moment. It's not soft as it might be, but it's nicely filtered by the clouds. Look at this great, wonderful pa passing the parade we're having. Hello, chaps. Now, of course, David Gitu would consider this a completely ridiculous thing for us to be doing. Uh, common, as, common as you like in Kenya, but here to have a sighting of wildebeest like this is fantastic. Let's count the little ones. One, two, three, four, five, six. Does anybody remember how many there were to start with? One, two, three, four... Five, six, or the seven, maybe. Conrad says six, so I think that they've all survived. Oh, in fact, got more. One, two, three, four, five, six, six. It is six. So they've fared rather better than the Egyptian goslings, which may have gone from seven to zero rather quickly. It's a bit sad. Those of you who don't know, we've been following the fates of eight Egyptian goslings, and one of them died, and then the rest stayed at Piffelsel Quarter Hole for some time, very comfortably, and uh, now they've all disappeared, including their parents. They might be in another water hole somewhere else. Absolute panic. Unique, I think that is an brilliant description of them. You say they look like cow horses. They do look like cow horses. The reason they panicked there was not because Craig waved at them or said something nasty. It's because there's a warthog that's come down to a little pan behind this thicket that we're looking at. Just behind that thicket there, Craig, is there is a water, pa a water pig. Let me just carry on. We'll go a little bit closer and see if the water pig isn't uh, confiding enough to let us look at him. There he comes just seen us. Don't worry, carry on with your day, as you were. 
Young male ward pig. Thinks he's hidden in the shade. Doesn't know about the sharp eyes of Craig. <laughs> Come on then, what are you looking for? Some you aged just nine years old, the answer to your question is, well, almost. Some of the animals out here are very good at surviving without water. The Stienbock is one such animal. They are desert adapted in many respects. The leopard is another that can survive almost without water. Blackback jackals do very well in some dry areas. But warthogs and wildebeest, for example, are animals that need to drink very frequently. So they will not do well in any kind of dry or desert environment. Now I can tell it's a young male, of course, by the fact that he has four warts on his face. Two big ones next to his eyes, and two smaller ones behind his great big canine teeth. The ones that have just erupted from the side of his mouth. He seems very nervous of being looked at. Young male trying to find his way in the world. The young males trying to find their way in the world can often be slightly nervous of being looked at. Craig, you get quite nervous being looked at, don't you? Mm -hmm. See, he does. <laughs> On we go. It's very crystal clear this afternoon, as I'm sure you saw when Ralph was showing you the mountains. We were going to try and do the same, but there was a telegraph line, well, it was a power line or so much, a telegraph line, cutting our picture in half, so he gave up on that. Telegraph line, how old am I? I'm not that old. We're going up Mandorza Road now, through the central western regions. Kirsten, what was that foul thing you said into my ear? Oh, they're just basic, basically saying I am old. What age is middle-aged? Craig, any idea? 42 is middle-aged, says Kirsten. Oh, good. Well, I've got a few months then. I'm still young. I'm still a youth. Ah, 45 to 65 is middle-aged. Gosh, I'm a spring chicken. I've got another three years of youth to go. That's fantastic. Very exciting to be a youth again, when I thought I was middle-aged. A new lease on life. Do you ever, I sometimes, this has got nothing to do with safari as well, but I can't find anything safari-ish right now. Do you ever have dreams of going back to high school and being back in high school? I do from time to time. And it's almost like a new lease on life, because you go back to high school, but with the f knowledge that you have as a 40-year-old, which, of course, puts you in a rather advantageous position, I feel. But with an extra 20 years. Right, well, let's go back. I believe we're going across now to somebody who's just finished high school. Oh, you are so funny. I'll have you know, it's almost been... Eight years. Almost. No, no, that's wrong. Is that right? No, that's wrong. I finished in 2010 at the end of the year, so I suppose that's right. Oh, anyways, yes, I was in high school not so long ago. That's nice being young, James. Very nice. You enjoy your experienced years. But we are standing in a pool of water. Perhaps, James, if you dived into one of these puddles of mud, it might be the fountain of youth. Who knows? You won't know until you give it a try. And you could pop out looking like you're fresh from high school. Now, I was hoping to find some evidence of elephants that have been here, perhaps splashing themselves with mud and then leaving a very muddy trail that we can follow. But that's not the case at all. 
It doesn't really look like much has been in here besides the odd kudu. There's been a couple of impala that have come down to have a drink. But soon, this is not going to be a very nice place to come and wallow in. It's getting very muddy very quickly. And I can't imagine too many things are going to want to have a drink from here. Well, I don't think the elephants will be drinking from here. I think they'd just be using it as a mud bath. I don't think a buffalo would mind too much drinking this water. Actually, in an impala, in fact, they just drink whatever's in front of them. Some animals are pickier than others when it comes to fresh water. And no spiders, actually. I wonder if I wander around and in the corner. If I look over here where there's a bit of grass, I might find some spiders. Pierre, the buffalo, those are always a mystery. Um, at the moment, they seem to be... Actually, I spoke to a friend of mine, and uh, he said that even they have not been seeing buffalo, and he, work, work, he works down at Mala Mala. And, well, that's a property notorious for, uh, well, just animals all over of a variety of kinds. It's a very, very, very beautiful property. And he said the buffalo have been sneaking in and then literally disappearing straight off of the traverse back down towards this, um, the Sabi River and whatever other rivers might be down and around uh, a little bit further to the south and to the west. So that's quite crazy. He says they just pop on. So I don't know. They're obviously hanging around a bit further down there. I'm trying to see if I can see anything. But no spiders. Normally there's some great water spiders here that are always catching things. But I wonder where they've gone now. Perhaps it's a little bit too cold for them. Maybe in the shade. Anyways, that's all right. We can carry on from this little mud wallow. But um, it's a pretty cool spot. I would love to bring guests here just to take them out of the vehicle. Maybe have a little stop, a little stretch of the legs. And just to show them what sort of goes on around a, a mud wallow. You know, seeing all vegetation around it that's completely covered in mud. There's probably, I mean, the leaves aren't too covered in mud. But there's lots of mud going down further. So maybe from an elephant or something standing here, wallowing away. Or even a buffalo or a rhino coming past and just scraping along it as they go out. Because, you know, they love to use the bushes for a little scratch too. So that's also a possibility. And then, Ferg, you're going to have to do a bit of walking, my friend. Because there's something very cool that I need to show everybody. So I'll meet you here. I'll see you in a minute. <laughs> It was a long walk, eh, Ferg? <laughs> long walk to freedom there. Debbie, I would say yes, most of the impilers have finished their rut. We're not really seeing them as aggressive as they were this morning. We watched two postured one another for a good couple of minutes and didn't really seem like they were going to fight at all. We're not hearing the gurgling sounds right through the evening like we were just a few weeks ago. So I suppose we are at the tail end now. It should be ending shortly. But uh, have a look at this beautiful... What's one, what was once a little acacia tree. It's, it's dwarfed at the moment. Go to see. Ah, so look at all the mud on there. So this is the rubbing post. This is the official rubbing post for this little pan. I'd love to know how many different animals have actually been here and scraped off of the excess mud. And then it's not just that. Oh, my goodness. If you look inside here... Wow, what's going on? There's a whole lot of ants. Huge. There's some, well, not huge ants. Some of them are a bit bigger. Herbie's also told me that he can hear something. Oh, they're preparing their, look, I wonder if those are alates. So we've obviously had a bit of rain at the moment. And normally after a bit of rain, the ground is nice and soft and termites and ants will release alates. They look like cocktail ants, actually. You know the way that they are cocking their tails out. Maybe one of them. And I think that was a little winged alate, so it could have been a prince or a princess getting ready to move on out. And, well, start a new life, start a new colony somewhere else. That is really amazing. I'm not trying to not get pricked by thorns so I can see. Ooh. Well, it doesn't seem like they're attacking it. Maybe they're just helping it, guiding it. Everybody well, saying, well done, good luck on your adventure. Maybe something along those lines. Oh, that's awesome to see. So there we go. We might as well check with the termite mounds tonight. Maybe something for Rolf and James to do a little bit later because they typically will release them just as the sun has set, that sort of first hour of darkness. We might get some cool silhouette shots of them taking off. Just got to find the right termite mound or hole in the ground for the ants. 
Oh, very cool. Now, like I said, Herbie had actually... Ew! Ish, the thorns. Sorry, watch you don't get stuck on those thorns, Ferg. Yes, these are nasty pieces of work here. Herbie gave me the signal. He said something was going... Bah! Bah! I don't know if it was baboons or if it was a kudu barking, but Herbie's over there, so we're going to go that way. I think... He obviously wants to go and follow up. And Herbie pointed in that direction. And funny enough, James has just heard some alarm calls in the distance. Well, we've been told about alarm calls in the distance. And I was just thinking to myself, although no one will believe me when I say this, that if Hukumuri did come on to Juma, the likelihood is that he's gone towards Galago Pan, which is just near the camp, just near the final control. And so I thought to myself, I think we'll go and check there. Well, blow me down if I don't get a radio call saying there are monkeys alarming at Galago Pan right now. Go and have a look. So that's what we're doing at great speed. This is where David Eastor and I ran down the road this morning on our run. We were going this fast, probably faster even. We were going so fast. Now, Galago Pan's down there, but if Hukumuri is coming from this end, I think he's going to pitch up at the Vuyatela Dam. So I'm going to go down that way first, and then we'll approach from that side. Aubrey is around looking there as well. There's an Impala looking very relaxed. I'm not going to stop and listen just yet. We can just get into the area first. Apparently there are a lot of Impala looking relaxed on the dam camera as well, which doesn't bode too well for our search. But let's go and see. Up and over the little bumpy and another one. Oh, unique. What a terrible dream. You dreamt last night that Hukumuri died. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I hope he didn't. Uh, do your dreams normally come true? Just a barbet flying overhead. Alrighty, we're arriving at the Vuyatela Dam now. There's a booby trap in the road here, masquerading as a drainage bump. Whoops, there it is. We've made it safely. There we go. One more. All righty. Now we can switch off and listen. No, all I can hear is the wind in my ears. Some very chilled looking impalas and a chilled looking nyala. Okay, I'm going to stop here and just listen. There we go, pans in that way. But there seems to be no more sound coming from that direction. Okay, let's move quickly. Here we go. We'll go quickly around that way. I hope I haven't picked the wrong direction here. Monkeys will not alarm call for anything unless it's serious. So it's leopard or lion. There's some kudu running. Not in a panicked manner, just a sort of joggy kind of manner. Not alarming. So there is a lion or a leopard around here. Impala looking relaxed. We'll stop on the top here. Hello, Kudu. Have you seen any leopards? Hmm? Describe that response as nothing short of disdainful. Let's move on. Yes, she certainly does have a lot of ox peckers on. Those are those birds. With the... Oh, 
Oh, oh, oh. Oh, we must be careful. We don't want to drive too fast and drive over a whole lot of tracks. At the same time, we don't want to drive too slowly. Mr. Two Block, I'm afraid I don't know. I haven't checked up recently. You say is there's anybody is there any update on Hosanna? I haven't heard any update on him, I'm afraid. Last one I had was that he was on Elephant Plains, which is a long way to the west of us. But that was it. I believe he did have a meeting with the Anderson Mail. The meeting resulted in probably his scuttling away as fast as possible. The Anderson Mail is not to be trifled with very large mail in the western sector of the Sabi Sunt. Alrighty, we're into the area now, but I can't hear any monkeys alarming. Herbert is also coming into the area to give a hand. Right, let's quickly go across to Taylor and find out what she's going to do to help the cause here. We are, we are, we are. We're going to, James. We've just, uh, we've just been held up for a second. We've got some bones, some hair. This was dung, very, very old dung. But unfortunately for us, no, actually, fortunately for us, what am I talking about? It makes it a bit easier to see what's going on. So um, I need a stick. Because I'm not touching that with my hands. Let me break a stick off quickly. Sorry, why don't you have a look? Oh, I'll be two seconds. Yeah. Okay, got, got a little sticky. There we go. So this looks like vertebrae. And we're thinking maybe an impala or something like along those lines. There's lots of bits of bones here. And maybe from a hyena. Because, oh well, that would be very, very sore. And I'd be quite surprised to find so many bones in... Uh, in lion or leopard dung. I mean, if it's something really small, like a baby dacre or steenbok, you'll find lions and leopards will crunch cr right through it, or a baby impala, but that's not the case here. Maybe some of the shards of bone have been sort of digested, and only really hyenas have got teeth that are powerful enough to crush through bits of bone like this. And most lions, unfortunately, don't quite have that capability. Mmm, delicious, but that's enough poo poking for one afternoon. Uh, Herbie, what's the plan? That way. Back to Gallagher. Herbie says we're going to go be going in that way. So we are going to have to, if we want to help James, we're going to pick up the pace now. So what we will do, we're going to just meander over here. But once we get onto a road, I think we're going to actually try to utilize the roads and big animal pathways where possible, depending which is going to lead us on the quickest route. Sometimes the animal pathways are the quickest, but we're not going to be wading through thickets like this, I don't think. We're going to choose the path of uh, least resistance today. Oh, and I think somebody else that's choosing that uh, pathway today is Ralph. I wonder what other areas he's explored on Torchwood. Well, exploring is exactly what we're doing, and we're just, as I said, just driving up and down every single road we can come across. And yeah, we, we were a little bit out of signal for a little while, so we've just taken another road heading back uh, in a westerly direction just to get us back in that um, wavelength where we can broadcast back to everybody. But as I say, for the moment it's a little bit quiet, but I'm not fussed. It's uh, all exciting and Dalvi and myself, we're both enjoying it here, just looking at the new terrain and hoping that something pops out in front of us, but um, yep, we'll wait a little bit later. It seems James and Taylor both all over those alarm signals. I'm really hoping that that is Shudulu. Haven't seen her for a little while, so I hope that she's uh, decided to show up and then near to Galago Pan. That will be wonderful. Look at this. This is like a... A little bit of a sodic patch here, maybe, because you can see a lot of these, um, well, there's some young leadwoods, there's some sickle bushes, there's uh, the silver cluster leaves and obviously the red bush willows. So when it's dominated like that, we've got finger grass, 
and some of the herringbone too so it's just one of these little sodic sites so you know you often have a, a, a bit of a, a place where your water is seeping out and then it will be evaporating and leaving a lot of the mineral salts and then you have a lot of these particular trees growing in this kind of areas They're nice and open but uh, it's quite devoid of animals for now just keep searching around as we go and enjoying the new space what does the next corner hold for us what are we gonna find I'm gonna wait until it's dark and get lost around here that'll be nice and Davi and let my battery run fat so we don't have a map we'll land up in the Kruger <laughs> Uh, that, that is a joke, by the way. That's just a joke. Oh, crossroads, Darby, which way? Okay, right. Right. Aha. See, I love this kind of navigating. Oh, and there's some red grass here. Tamida triandra. That, this is the kind of grass we want to see because this is very nutritious grass and we'll be finding animals feeding on that more so than a lot of the other grasses. So. But it's not dominating, it's just a little bit of little patches, patches of it. Not uh, quite unlike in the Maasai Mara, especially in the, the Mara Triangle, it's dominated by that red grass. And that's why the elephants and all the animals are, are there uh, fattening themselves up and just eating grass, which is for me fascinating. I've never seen elephants eating grass like they do in the Maasai Mara, and in the Mara Triangle to be specific. Wow, this is very, very nice. Now, Philip, there's not a particular time that elephants will necessarily go into must together. Um, they do it, uh, it's normally fortnightly or every three weeks once they become uh, or, or get to ma uh, sexual maturity. So it's sort of once they hit around 20 years old or so, then they will come into uh, once, sometimes twice a month, um, uh, they will go into must. So. And it will be different for every single individual, just depending on his age and when he was born and all of that. So, yeah, and that, that then ensures a nice cycling of um, bulls coming into must at different times randomly. And that's one of the things in the bush as well. Randomness is one of the most important ecological factors because nothing is really always in tune you've just got random things happening you know like I often think when I go for a run and the lizards are running away from me um, if they run away from me there could be a predator waiting there and it's just total random that I was running there that the lizard ran away and then there was yeah, and he ran in a particular direction uh, away from me and then something might nail that and you know things happen randomly which is actually quite scientifically proven to be one of the best ecological factors um, that uh, keeps uh, the diversity in the bush. So we even studied it in ecology. Randomness was one of our real subjects uh, that we, we went through and uh, one of the real important factors out here. Like for instance where a seed lands totally random it might be blown by the wind it might be dropped with a baboon having eaten the fruit and then sitting on a termite mound uh, it might be carried by a, a bird stuck on its bill and wiped off on a random branch so there is so much around randomness that you could go on for days about that uh, a spider throwing his uh, little web into the wind and where it randomly gets blown and hooks on a branch um, you know all these little random uh, randomness that can turn into patterns as well. It's uh, quite incredible. So yeah, randomness. One of the very important uh, topics that we did discuss and study. It's, it's, it's quite strange to st say that you study randomness. Well, it's very interesting, eh? So there's a lot of things that do not happen uh, through sheer random. <laughs> yeah, Kirsten's saying that must be nice to study. Well, it's it's pretty random to study, I would say. But it, it's, yeah, 
pretty strange that randomness can be so specific and so make for such unique biodiversity. And it's very important that you do have randomness. So not everything needs to be set by a pattern. And I mean, you can have birds landing um, randomly with migration. They get blown off course. You have random weather patterns. You have, you know, there's, there's randomness is basically infinite. So, yeah, it's like where the termites, when the alates, when they go out of their nest and they they just land randomly at a place and they randomly meet up with another random female or, or male, you know, and then they. They, they dig in a random spot and hopefully it's not on the road because then they get squashed by moving through but you know all these termite mounds they would have started off by randomly um, getting to a little spot uh, that stopped them from moving any further and that's where they started and now we've got all sorts of different randomness that birds will land on it uh, baboons will go and feed on it Now, Cheeky Beaky Beth, I think I've got that right, I hope I have, Cheeky Beaky Beth. Um, well, the randomness does keep nature in check, absolutely, I agree with you. And that's why it's such an interesting topic. So, yeah, you, please feel free to send in any, any of your random um, sort of systems that you see in nature, how things happen randomly that, that cause then uh, the diversity or the uniqueness of nature. Very, very interesting topic that. I mean, like the leopards, sometimes they can also just be randomly walking up a road and then they, you know, you've got two impala that are fighting um, and like Shudulu, she's absolutely random in her movements, but with her being so random, she comes across quite a lot of uh, potential food uh, sources because she's zigzagging, she's going up to her might mount, she's coming down, she's jumping up the tree, uh, she's playing with her prey, you know, so that randomness, I think, makes her actually more success successful than if she was just walking around on a set route on a, every single day doing exactly the same thing that randomness really mixes it up and actually puts her in a better position so it's good to be random I think is the moral of the story <laughs> now, Kathy, I haven't seen any random animals just yet. I did see two uh, random uh, grey-headed bush shrikes that seem to be chasing each other quite randomly. And there's a squirrel running up the road. Let's see how random he's going to be. Watch him there, just dead up there. And I bet you it's going to be two seconds and he's going to... Oh. I love the way they run. I love the way they run. And the track that they leave, it's always, it's always one, two, one, two, one, two. It's a very random track from a very random animal. That's uh, very random, wouldn't you say, Darby? <laughs> I think, which way? Left. Okay, random chosen. Let's see. There we go. And now? Straight. Okay, so while we go up this random road and hope for anything random to jump out the bush, let's head you on over to James and see how random he is. I don't think that I'm very random at all. Randomness in nature is actually a fascinating concept. Uh, as it is in economics, for example. And it is the cause of black swan events in nature and in economics. We're looking at a red-billed hornbill, in case you're wondering. And we've had no sign of any track whatsoever. And when used in the way that Kirsten has just used it, for example, that's so random, it is, it is in fact nonsensical. There's nothing random about that hornbill. What she means is how obscure, which is different from being random, I think. Kirsten, would you like to come back? 
Or do you think that I'm right, perhaps? I don't think that they are two words that can be used interchangeably. I might be wrong, though. He's having a good Sunday bath. Everyone should bath at least once on Sundays. So that you're fresh for the week, Craig, you know. I like to bath on Sundays. Have my weekly bath on Sundays. I nearly even had a shave today, if you can believe it. But then there was no hot water and I decided, no, that would be sore. I can hear, the only thing I can hear alarm calling at the moment are some chin spot battises. And they're going to but I'm not sure that that's what they'd be calling it a leopard. Teresa, I can do my best. Uh, you want to see a yellow-billed hornbill? I don't see why we shouldn't be able to find one for you. They're common. So we'll maybe try and find one for you. I'm going to go up this way because Aubrey went down that way towards the Vuyatella waterhole where we saw lots of general game, very relaxed. So we'll just listen out for the radio and then just see if we don't pick something up going up this road here. As Craig said to me, well, they're not alarm call for something else, like a mamba or something. Yeah, they might. They might also alarm for an aerial predator, uh, like a crowned eagle. I suppose they might for a martial eagle, as Craig suggested. But they wouldn't alarm for many of the smaller things that uh, squirrels and franklins and mongoose would alarm call for. All right, we've got Aubrey going down Central Road. Cecilia, the best time to see wor words, to see birds in this part of the world. Sorry, um, Kirsten, I can't hear you. The game drive radio is going. Can I go now with the name? Ravinda. Best time to see birds is between November and April, basically. All of the birds are back by, well, mid November. And they will stay here, the migratory species until around about April and then they'll all go back up to the north uh, either intra-African or Palearctic. Some very angry Franklins there next to this or behind this herd of Impala. Impala are looking so those Franklins are going really upset but you know, they could be upset at anything. Just a little suspicious that it's around this particular area. So the Impala cast their eyes towards that area, but didn't worry too much about it. We can drive down there. It's on the old Hyena Den Road. So let's pop down. It's going to drive a little bit faster. I think it's here somewhere, isn't it? Yes, here it is. And it's a hyena. Coming to check out the old neighborhood. Franklin's still shouting, close by. Mm, I feel like they're close enough to the Impala that the Impala would have reacted more angrily if they'd seen a predator. You see one. It's just in here, the Franklins. I'm 
sure you can hear that, but I can't see what is making the noise. Okay, let's carry on because whatever it is is moving. I can see the impala still completely relaxed. The other side there. It's a horrific road full of stumps. This is the old hyena den. It's nice to pop past here. No one is at home. Hasn't been for some time. No. A wild alarm call chase. Taylor and Herbert are coming up here, and so that's the best way to find predators, basically on foot. We are, James, we're not far actually, we're about to pop out onto Central, maybe only 200 meters from Voyatella Dam, so we're almost there, we've been marching. Oi, watch out, Ferg, Let's take a step to the left. <laughs> have to guide, I'm going to have to guide you, hey? <laughs> uh, anyway, so we're on a big animal pathway, as you can see, which is quite nice. This is a very well-worn one. I've actually shown it to you a couple of dif uh, different times. I've seen Tingana walking down it. I've actually seen Tandi walking down it, Karula many times with Shongile and Hosana and Tail. And... Uh, who else? Lots of big animals too. Elephants like to walk it, as you can imagine. It's quite a nice, uh, a nice pathway because it's open, and then you can have grass or leaves, so you can feed on the two. If you know, if you're on the road, you're a bit restricted. You kind of just got grass that's growing there, and then the vegetation starts a little way off. But yeah, I'm just listening as well. We can't hear any of those alarm calls just yet that James has got up ahead. Now, Brian, it's fairly easy to find your way in a reserve, but that's also because I've been based here for almost two years now. And uh, you kind of just get used to it, and you use the sun to orientate yourself. You use, of course, uh, well, you can use stars. Not that we're walking around at night, but if you get a bit lost in the evening. And then, of course, as you're going about, you start to notice, well, certain things, certain landmarks, big termite mounds, massive marula trees, big knob thorns or leadwoods that have been pushed on over. So you'll use those as well. And you just get familiar over time. If I always say the first game reserve you uh, work on is the hardest to learn and then it becomes substantially easier along the way. As, uh, we didn't find it too hard to navigate in the Mara, it was actually quite easy. In fact, it was you had the escarpment, on one side you had the river on the other, <laughs> so to stay in between. And when you wanted to go home, keep the river on your right, keep the escarpment on your left-hand side and head north. And you'll eventually find a road that looks familiar. So that's really the plan. Uh, well, that's the plan when you're starting out. Otherwise, it's fairly easy. Now, we're still just trying to make up some distance before the sun goes down, because it's going to go down quickly. But uh, we'll hopefully find that whatever is scaring the birds. James, however, has found some elephants. Did she say live, live? As the game drive radio just exploded to life in my ear. Anyway, here we are with an elephant bull, young bull. He's just sort of ex examining us. He just was wandering kind of aimlessly down towards us here and then stopped when he heard us, as we did when we saw him. Probably seems to be recently tossed out of his herd, I guess. Shame, poor little fellow, lonely on a Sunday afternoon. See how close he comes. I'm just going to be very quiet. He poses no danger to us. We obviously pose no danger to him. Okay, here we go. 
So sometimes these young bulls will just pretend to eat when they become relatively entertained by the presence of a human being. Hello. I think that, you know, they're such social creatures, elephants. And I think being pushed out on their own is sometimes difficult. So they'll seek out company. Like I think Hosanna used to. That's not going to make any friends whatsoever. And it really is manners from the bowels of the bowels. I'm just, I'm not starting the engine because I don't want him to feel like we're a threat. I'd rather like him to just come and say hello to us. So it's a little awkward with the aerial in the way. I'm sorry about that. now hiding behind the bush. Thinks we can't see him. They are cheeky, Gemma. You say that yeah, you love young bulls because they're so cheeky. They're cheeky, but they're also inquisitive. I don't think he's being cheeky just yet. He's just being inquisitive. No, don't go away. Come on. Stay with us. Let's just watch carefully if he is actually eating. Now you see, he's just sort of pretending a little bit. Got an itchy tummy. <laughs> okay, we can turn around now. <laughs> now, you see, if you watch him now, it's going to turn quickly so you can look. Look at his reaction to us as soon as we started the engine. He started to feel threatened immediately. The tail came out and he took a few steps to get away from us and now he's turned to face us and flapped his little trunk over his tusks. So he was immediately threatened by the starting of the vehicle. And that's normal. He's on his own. Young bull, I wouldn't say he's more than 18, 17, 18 years old. And the confidence that he felt in the herd that uh, re resulted in his bullying the young youngsters and eventually getting thrown out by the matriarch, that confidence has evaporated as he's gone off on his own. Sorry, Sean, I've got a little bit about what gets tossed out of the herd. I missed the rest. Sorry about that. Oh, do elephant cows ever get tossed out? Not at puberty, but there must be some splitting of herds because obviously herds don't just get bigger and bigger and bigger. They, they split. And in this area, 10 to 15 is about the average size of a herd in total, which means that at some stage they must split up. Now whether that's a, I don't know, uh, what should we say, not physical altercation but a permanent disagreement if you like that occurs between two cows in a herd and uh, one takes her faction off, I'm not sure, or whether it's just a slightly more distantly related cow moving off on her own uh, to set up her own herd, I think that's much more likely because it gets unwieldy moving around in a big herd out here. 10 to 15 seems to be the optimum number. So, uh, you know, the short answer is no, they don't get tossed out at puberty like these chaps do. But they do split from time to time. Alrighty, Ralph Kirsten is still knocking about on Torchwood, I hope, and he, he's found some water.
Yeah, this is called Leadwood Dam. Well, it's Leadwood Waterhole, Leadwood Dam, Leadwood Pan, whatever you want to call it. And there's obviously um, a number of Leadwoods around. There is one solitary hippo, and there's also a pair of Egyptian geese. Sorry for all your Gosling fans, I don't see any Goslings with them, so we haven't solved the mystery just yet, unless they miraculously appear out of the grass. There's also a couple of water thickney just running around there. There's one of them. I think there's another one somewhere, part of a pair. Ooh, there's a bearded woodpecker hitting on a branch nearby. And so, nice little spot for birding and the Torchwood Lodge is just behind us so this is a view that they've got from their camp uh, at night with a nice uh, spotlight down over this little pan here and there's signs of elephants and I'm sure you'd have all sorts coming through here at night leopard to lion to jackals and caracal maybe even porcupines all sorts it's a lovely spot it is very nice very calm at the moment Uh, take care. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that they would have called Torchwood after um, the Balanites. There's probably a lot. I've seen a few. I haven't seen uh, sort of hundreds of them that, that would suggest that the place is called that. But um, yeah, well, we've just pretty much run a, a, a little bit of a sort of a cross through the through the uh, traverse for now. Um, and as I say, I haven't seen too many, but yeah, sometimes, you know, there might be one particular area that they call this place after. Maybe as we go down, this drainage line in front of us is also part of the Mloalmini, which also includes and links um, back up onto Juma. Now, I'm going to continue down and let's see what else we can find. But it seems James has got my favorite mammals to show you once again. Well, here we have some elephants. The, obviously the herd from which that youngster is being excluded slowly. They're not very relaxed. They've seen something that's made them feeling upset. It's made them feel upset, not feeling upset. Now the big cow to the right hand side of your screen there with flapping her ears, that's her. She just went like this. She went and as she did that the herd started to move forward. The younger cow, the ears out, is showing not extreme discomfort, but certainly a level of discomfort that would make me want to back off if it wasn't for the fact, ah, you see, she's not a cow at all, the young bull. And this big cow at the back is clearly administering a little bit of discipline. That's what's going on here. I suspect that she is the reason that young bull was on his own. Not putting up with any nonsense. That was her calf. I think the little calf is shouting because she wants milk. No, Kirsten, that was not me, that was the little calf. Kirsten is directing the show, by the way, in case you're wondering who I'm talking to. Ball. <laughs> this is lovely. Now, here comes... That's the young bull. No, it's not. Sorry, to the left of the... That's the youngster who was standing in the middle of the road with his ears out. Actually, it is possible, but it's very unlikely. Now, it is a cow, you know, that's not a young bull. It is a cow, just an, not a very confident one. Young cow of the herd. Actually, really interesting. She's got very small mammary glands. which indicates either that she hasn't had a baby, I think she's pregnant actually, if you look at the, her belly, she's, yeah, she's quite heavily pregnant. 
But I suppose perhaps as with human beings, elephants have mammary glands of different sizes that make absolutely no difference to their efficacy as deliverers of milk. That's quite interesting. Never thought of it like that. Um, regarding elephants that have never seen humans before, yes, it is possible. It's very, very unlikely in the Kruger National Park. It would certainly be possible in a place like, um, what should I say, in an area like Gorongosa in Mozambique, that's possible, more remote areas, uh, possibly some of the more remote areas of Zambia. You know, you've got quite large swathes of land that don't have any people in them. Uh, that's possible. But it's, it's unlikely that in, on a continent of one billion people that the elephants haven't somehow, somewhere, come across a human being. <laughs> well, at age four, you're going to get yourself into trouble by asking this question, because your mother's going to ask why you're asking it. You say, do, do the elephants ever hide, pretend they're feeding when they're not actually eating? No, they don't. They don't need to, Willow, because their mothers don't tell them they have to eat. They just get hungry and eat. So although their mothers will show them what to eat, they don't check how much they eat. So they don't feel like eating, they just don't eat. Unlike us when we're little, Willow, like you, for example, I'm sure there are lots of things that your mum and dad tell you to eat and you don't like to eat them. And so you sort of pretend to eat them and maybe you feed them quietly to the dog under the table or slip them into your pocket. Don't forget to take them out of your pocket if you do do that. <laughs> well, I don't know about you, but when I was your age, my mother used to make me want make me eat pears, and I couldn't stand eating pears. I still don't like pears because of it. I remember that very distinctly. And scrambled eggs. I used to pretend to eat my scrambled eggs. But we had a very hungry dog at home, and she quite liked scrambled eggs. She didn't even mind pears. Very fat Labrador. Didn't look anything like these elephants. <laughs> there's, a, there's a younger elephant just off to the right hand side now. Yes, in some better light than those other ones. Hello, yes, that's right, you're on camera now. It's because you're very smart. Quite interesting. Let's just go back here. So, no, don't worry, Craig. The way she's moving. That same cow was just giving us a, the open-eared look. And stay with this youngster. So obviously, the matriarch of this herd brooks no trifling with, and so everyone's a little bit on edge. And she's tossed out that main male that we saw earlier. She might accept him back if he behaves, if he promises not to bully anyone. Well, Saskia, I think that what happens is that they, they slowly start to move away from the herd. It's not a kind of cutting of the ties. So they'll spend increasing amounts of time away from the herd and then rejoin it again, and ex increasing distances away from the herd and then rejoin. So they rejoin all the time. I don't think they... Uh, they probably even join some herds that are unrelated to them, just for little periods, for short periods, until they really uh, are ready or feel sufficiently confident to go off on their own for extended periods. I'm pretty sure these elephants will eventually fetch up at either the Gallagher waterhole or the pan at Buyatella Dam. I'd just be able to hear the tearing of the grass. 
but I have heard no further alarm call of any sort whatsoever. Now, Tandy was seen late after drive at Bufflesook Dam, so that's where we're going to head now. It's in the far northeast corner. First, we will wait for this rather large cow to come towards us. Let's see what she does. Hello, my dear. You are not small. You're also not to be trifled with, I fear. She is also pregnant. I think. She's got much bigger mammary glands. Cheeky geeky Beth, in theory, yes, that is exactly what would happen. You say, what would happen if a if a cow ran out of milk, would the others help? Yes, they would. Elephants do pick up orphans. So it's quite possible that a nursing cow would allow a cow whose mother was producing insufficient milk to nurse from her. It doesn't always happen. But yes, they are friendly like that. They are familial like that. She's telling the others to get on with it. Go on, move on. Also pretending to eat there. Oh, she's having act maybe an actual bite. Maybe she just wanted that tree for herself. I think they've been to water actually already. I don't think that they are going down towards it. You can see they've got bits of mud on them. They've obviously had their drink, thrown their mud all over themselves, and now they're having their Sunday dinner. Mmm. Of silver cluster leaf. How delicious. And I believe Taylor might be quite close by on the termite mound, so uh, if she is uh, on the old hyena den, tell her that the elephants are coming her way, would you? <gasps> oh no, they're coming our way? As in where I'm standing right now? Well then we best, best be, be, we be quick then, so we get out of the pathway of the elephants. Looks like there were a few here, we passed some dung. Now, I can hear James just started up his vehicle, so he isn't too far away from us. Uh, so basically, we're at this termite mound that once was a hyena den, but it's not a hyena den anymore. And we're not going to get too close. First thing I'll show you why is because if you look over here, there's a track. That track over there is of a warthog. And there are lots and lots of warthog tracks going in and out of this, this burrow. It's quite a deep one. It goes in quite ba far back. I don't think there's anyone inside at the moment, but let's not take a chance. Maybe there's a porcupine or something. But you can see it was clearly a hyena den at some point. There's a piece of hide. I'm not going to pick it up. I'm not sure what it's from. It's also covered in mud at the moment, so it could be from anything. And then there's obviously part of a skull, part of a jaw, which I would imagine... Who's that from? Maybe something like an impala or even a bushbuck. What are you from? I wonder. It's been eaten. Mmm. Crunched away a bit, the little hyena cubs that were here. May have had fun with this. Trying to have a look as to what that could actually be. It's not actually a very big skull. Too big to be, I think, something like a... a um, steenbok or a daker. It might just be a young... Well, it's got fully developed teeth, though. I wonder what it was. I'm starting to think maybe, maybe like a bushbuck or something. Not quite like a female, female bushbuck, maybe. I think the skull would extend a little bit more, but yeah, very interesting, very cool. It's nice to know that somebody else is using this home, though, while uh, the hyenas are away. I've now touched something that doesn't smell very nice. I don't know what I just touched. There's another burrow actually just over here too. This one doesn't seem to be used as much though. That one seems to be active. There's some warthog tracks coming on around here. Walking it down and around. But it doesn't look like there's any hoof prints going all the way down inside. This one is not as sort of dug out as the other side. Very cool though. Very nice to see. It's actually a really big termite mine. You don't realize how big it is until you step out of the car and you come and stand next to it. It's massive. It's much bigger than any of the termite mounds I've seen the hyenas living in. Very cool.
Now, I don't actually just think that the, that there's warthogs living here. I think that there's some porcupine. Looks like a porcupine was digging and was eating some of the roots. And you know what? I think, who said, was it you, Ferg, that said to me you thought that there was a warthog, I mean, a porcupine living here as well? No. Who was it? Might have been Viem. Could it? Yeah, we, <laughs> we'll say it was Ferg. I think it may have been Viem saying he saw some evidence of porcupines around here. This makes sense too. So maybe there's a couple more tunnels too. Now, uh, Poige, uh, the natural habitat of a warthog is, well, typically a a burrow created by an aardvark or any animal that can dig. Warthogs can dig fairly well too, and they'll use a schnout because it's nice and hard. It's a bit of a shovel too if they need to shovel out some dirt. So living in a burrow of sorts, it doesn't have to just be in a term of mind. It can be straight down into the ground too. And, and then, well, they eat grass. So anywhere where there's grassy sort of areas, that's what they typically feed on. They'll every now and then nibble fruit as well. Wherever, wherever you find those kinds of things, that's where a warthog will hang around. So this is actually perfect for them. Nice spot, you get the afternoon sun, look at that. So maybe come home a little bit earlier, lay down in the, in the dust, enjoy the sun, listen to the calls of leopards in the night and hope that Hukumuri doesn't come and find you. <laughs> He's a specialist warthog hunter, that fella, and waits for them. Must be terrifying being a warthog. Right, we're gonna keep going. I think we're going to move away and out from these elephants now. We'll see what Herbie has to say. Let's go to Rolf and uh, see if he's moved on from Ledwood Dam. Yep, we have moved on a little bit. Just uh, We've got lots to explore and discover. So um, there wasn't too much happening there at Ledwood Dam. So we thought we'd just continue on the exploration of the new traverse very pretty area this again we've been driving along the Mulwalnini uh, drainage line which is a mouthful but uh, at least here we've got a good opportunity of finding leopards in in these little drainage lines possibly still lying up in the shade and also maybe there's some lions around doing what they do best but that sun has started to head towards the horizon so and it's cooling down quite uh, quickly as it does at this time of year as soon as that sun starts to hit that low angle you start to feel the chills and especially now when you're driving away from the sun immediately in the shade uh, it uh, drops a couple of degrees immediately so yeah that's that time of the day now now we need to keep on the move and see if we can find any predators that are doing the same. But that was a lovely water hole there at Ledwood Dam. I'm going to be back there, go and check that area out, as well as those rocky areas, uh, especially in winter, I think are going to hold um, some animals on a nice uh, cold winter's morning. With the sun coming up, I can just see those lions lying on those rocks. It'll be perfect. Perfect. So, and we also saw a lot of euphorbias, euphorbia candelabra, candelabra, however you pronounce that, and like those big chandeliers that you get um, with the type of, um, with those type of candles on the end, apparently Kirsten telling me that James showed you um, uh, the other day, those euphorbias, so they were a little bit behind me, but now I'm just keeping on the move because I just want to see if we can find any animals moving around. I can hear some Koki Franklins calling. <laughs> Funny Franklins those are, very small ones. Actually, when you first see them, you might mistake them for like a grass. Now, my little map, which way are we going? Uh, we'll take this main road left. Go up here. I want to get onto a road that's called Lion Track. I've got a feeling there might be some lions on the Lion Track. But while we've got here just in front of us, there's a little emerald spotted wood dove. Now, Weedy in Washington, I hope that I can show you some lions because you're saying that you'd love to see some. Well, I'm going to head for Lion Track. I think that's probably the best spot to spot lions. And look at this little emerald spotted wood dove doing what they do best, foraging along the road. 
and generally doing it into the sun. You see, so my little tracking theory is a brilliant uh, way to work out and the time of day that this animal was walking because they normally walk into the sun and so if you've got a emerald spotted wood dove that walked over a track you need to look if he was going east or west uh, if he was going east then it's normally that he walked over it in the morning if he was going west then he would have been walking over it in the afternoon so you've got a little bit of a timeline there if you look at emerald spotted wood dove tracks and if they're going over on top or if they're underneath um, a leopard track or a, or a lion track and then you know using that as as a nice way to judge when the track that you're looking at to trying to work out when that animal moved through there um, with regards to the little emerald spotted wood dove and they've got a lovely call a very fluid and the the zulus and the shangans they say that it's a very sad bird that call especially um because uh he's saying that um Oh, his sister's sick, his brother's uh, in jail, his father's a drunk, his mother died last year, and I'm so sad, 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 You know, so a <laughs> very sad story coming from the emerald spotted wood dove. Shame. But, uh, yeah, I like to just think of him as a, as a very good tracking assistant. So... It seems uh, everybody's looking for birds and finding them. Let's head off to James and see what beautiful bird he has. I've got a beautiful birchal starling. There it is, sitting on a tree. See what I did there, Craig? Mm-hmm. Yes. And it's just sitting there. Not doing anything, except warming in the sun, possibly eating the odd zizifus fruit can find one. There's some on the tree there. We are now at Biffles of Quarter Hole, where the world's most boring hippopotamus are living, and there are n is no sign of the Egyptian geese and the goslings, I'm afraid, and nor is there any sign of Thundi or Thalumba. Now, it's just quite devastating that these Egyptian gooses have disappeared, but it's entirely possible given the distance they walked to get to the Vuyotella waterhole that they've just gone somewhere else that they weren't heading back here at all when they headed off in this direction they've gone to find another waterhole somewhere else well done Craig let me just go forward a little bit Leopard could pop out here at any stage. Oh, Arla Aramur, I think very effectively one is taken back to that classic Disney sh uh, movie of the 80s called The Incredible Journey, where I said two dogs and a cat, or two cats and a dog, or something. Uh, make their way over hill and dale to get home. No, it's not homeward bound. Kirsten, it was made before you were born. Anyway, uh, I think they find their instincts for finding home are exceptional, and my evidence for that is Sindila, the young male leopard, who was Shadow's son. He went into rehab for rabies for six months, came back. We don't know exactly where he was released for some unknown reason. There's a whole veil of secrecy over that. Anyway, he was released back into this area and made his way straight back into his mother's territory. So he knew exactly where he was after a six-month absence. So I don't think it takes him very long to learn an area at all. And whether or not they're actually picking landmarks or just feeling familiar or picking up smells or whether they have some kind of ability to navigate like birds do using um, the earth's magnetic field some birds are able to do that i don't know but i think their ability to know exactly where they are is exceptional all right not much going on here so let's continue homeward bound 
indeed. Uh, we did see some of what Ralph is just about to show you now. Real symbiosis in action because the, I've stopped here and there's a couple of hornbills around with these little dwarf mongoose and the mongoose are now really relaxing with our presence. I know we're shooting straight into the sun so Darby's got to play nicely with his settings there and be overexposed but look now all the little dwarf mongoose are starting to get relaxed and I'm still quite nervous that we're here and they can hear me talking as well. But we're very close to them. Oh, the one's even standing up. Oh, of course, as I said that, he went down. He was having a real good look at us. Like a surrogate. Very cute. The hornbills were just off the road there. They're not quite as... Uh... Oh, this one looks like a very young one. It's a little baby. It's a smaller one anyway. Looks like it could be a baby. Oh, that one's got a bit of a wet patch on its back, or it's missing some hair. One of the two. What's happened to you, buddy? You get you get a close call. Maybe a raptor or something got hold of him and he managed to get away. Hmm. It looked like quite a big wound on its back at one stage, if it was a wound, or it, uh, I think it was. It looked like it was a bare patch. You see how close they are to us with the vehicle We're right next to them and they're making nice little noises. Yeah, so look at this. There's all sorts happening with these little guys coming out all over the place. And Kirsten says there's a bit of action just nearby to me. I'm, uh, I'm actually on my way to a sighting, but um, uh, it's one of those animals that are probably not going to be moving too far. So I will be on my way there shortly. But we'll just enjoy these, these little mongoose for a little while here. Hey, eh? I love watching mongoose. The Herpestidae family. Also one of the ones that do sort of anal markings, that anal gland. That's how they mark their territories. There must be some kind of little resource here. I don't know if it's insects around. As I say, the, little, the hornbills were here, also feeding. All right, I think it's time to start up and head on down. Let's go see if we can find... Um, there's some animals just up the road here, not far from us. So I'm going to see if I can catch up with them. All right, so I'm going to listen out on the radio and find out exactly what's going on. Um, but I'm sure there's all sorts going on with the Bushwalk team. Let's head over to them and see how they're going. We're just standing in the golden light. Hey, Ferg, just, just doing this. Waiting patiently, and we waited patiently. Now have a look at this. I almost, I basically almost died this afternoon. I'm just joking. I didn't almost die, but I almost fell into a very big hole. Now what we've got over here is quite interesting. It's an intricate system of burrows beneath the earth, but unfortunately it's all collapsed. You can see, look how the sand has just fallen down over the entrance of that tunnel. And I don't know if there were maybe porcupines or a family of warthogs living here because it's an extensive area. And then. This is what can get you into a lot of trouble with the vehicles, is when you come off-roading here and you can't see it because of the tall grass, you would go straight down and probably get the vehicle quite stuck. Now, this is epic. Look how the ground has just sunk straight down into the middle. Now, you wouldn't want to fall in there, and the rest of it is all hollow underneath. And it's amazing. It's a huge tunnel network, and I don't even think we can begin to guess how far these tunnels go in and how how much space is actually underground here but a perfect spot for warthogs for porcupine even an, an aardvark hyenas tortoises well not down in here now steve you've said wow i kind of wish i had a big powerful torch kind of like the ones we have on the on the vehicles that i could shine on down in here and just see exactly how deep it actually is 
But I thought that that was quite amazing. I mean, we're lucky that we found this because now when we do come off-roading in here, which is an area we try and navigate, I know where not to drive, where not to bring a vehicle anywhere. Because I even think if we extend to where I'm walking now, I think even up to about here we could be in a little bit of trouble. But luckily for us, none of us are heavy enough to make the earth collapse. I mean, it's, it's, it's probably about that thick, but a vehicle that weighs well over a ton can probably, probably be in a bit of trouble. Fantastic. Where did Herbie go now? This way. Oh, this side. I heard him whistle. Shall we go that way? So we haven't picked up any signs whatsoever of a predator. Obviously, that's why we've come to walk in this area. You can hear the elephants getting closer and closer. So we're going in the opposite direction. And this is where the alarm calls were coming from. We were chatting about whether the vervet monkeys that were alarming, I think they were vervet monkeys, could have seen a predator all this way. And I think it depends on which tree they were sitting on. But um, I do think that it is possible. But this is a fairly sandy animal pathway that we're now on. And I think that we would be able to see some tracks, especially if they were fresh. I don't think it would be too much of a problem. Someone was running here, however, maybe an impala, just dashing across this pathway. Hmm. Now, Pucker, who is only five years old, I'm trying to think of what alarm calls I think are quite scary. Hmm. Can you think of any? When you hear a kudu and it does its big bark standing right next to you, but you don't know that the kudu is there because it's hiding away and they're fairly well camouflaged, that's scary. Do you know what just gave us a really big fright now? We're some birds. Can you believe it? The Franklins. They're probably the most terrifying. They're only scary when you're on foot because you're walking, walking, and they panic and they've seen you. Now they go, do we pretend that we're not here and just sit quietly in the grass? And then they go, okay, okay, right, everybody, we're going to pretend we're not here. We're going to hide from the humans. And then last minute one goes, I can't do it, I'm too scared. And then flies out and goes, ah, 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 but it's right at your feet. And then you jump back. Herbie and Ferg did a leap of about two meters backwards. I also got a fright. I was blinded by the sun. So I was like, oh, I don't know what's going to get me anyways, but uh, they give you a fright. Jackals don't have a very nice alarm call. It sounds like somebody screaming, which is not very nice when they, when they are shouting or howling into the night. Hmm, who else? What about a baboon? When a baboon goes, Jabba! They don't say that, but that's uh, what I have to say to make a, a baboon sound. Ralph actually does a very good balloon. A balloon, not a balloon, a baboon alarm call. We'll have to ask Ralph. Paco, we can ask Ralph to make a, a baboon alarm call for you. I'm sure he'll be obliging. Kirsty, who's directing the show, she says a human. Yes. We don't have a very nice one. And we normally use colourful words when we get scared. Hey, Ferg. <laughs> right, down into the drainage line we go. This is a lovely area. It really is quite nice for walking. It's only going to get better and better in winter. It's very, very pretty. Now, it seems as though just as we are taking the path less traveled today, so is James. I wonder where he's on to. We've just checked the brown ivory tree where Tingana had his kill. It was exactly a week ago, I think, he whacked that impala and stuck it in the tree when it was raining. Um, and it's not there, which means that somebody's taken it out of the tree. Perhaps a bird dropped it or uh, Tandi went up and scavenged it. But we do have some information that Tandi's tracks are going south down Drakensberg Road, which is not too far from here, just in the far west, far east, east, east. I've also had a lovely message from Kirsten McLennan-Smith that says, apparently Project Alpha, you confirmed that the incredible journey was also known as Homeward Bound, so we were both correct. She then sent me a rude sign uh, with a picture of uh, Project Alpha's tweet, and there's a rude sign with it that I can't share with you. This is what we put up with on Drive, you know, trying to concentrate, trying to do the best we can, and we get abuse from the final control. Just abuse, that's all. I won't show it to you. You'll be shocked. But a lady could have sent such a thing. Huh? Terrific. 
Anyway, there's a little water hole up here on Drakensberg Road. We'll drive down there and see if we do not get lucky. There's a yellow-billed hornbill. Who wanted to see a yellow-billed hornbill? There it is, there it is. Quickly, Craig, that's going to fly away and have a birthday. Teresa, there you are. Are you not pleased, Teresa? I'm sure you are. How could you not be? Especially as it's a very confiding hornbill. Doesn't seem to be particularly worried by us. And what's he eating? Is it a... it's not a chameleon, is it? Oh, it's a little... Uh, catadid. No, it's a mantis, you're absolutely correct. Well done, Craig. A mantis. Poor mantis. You're crushing the wings there. Crushing the chitin in the wings and the exoskeleton. That's what this is it's all about, because obviously there's no chewing. Finding teeth in hornbill's bills are like finding hen's teeth. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And down the hatch it goes. Swallow! Mm. Let's hope it's not wriggling and jiggling and jiggling inside her. Well done, Teresa. Epic! Yellow-billed hornbill sighting there. Marvellous. Let's continue, shall we? Yes, we shall. Vroom, vroom! If ever you are wondering about the road names here and you want to know where we are or how, and eventually I imagine that we will be able to give you a, an actual live feed of where we are, but the, the Google Maps uh, map of Juma has all the road names on it. And so if you're ever wondering, if I say I'm on Drakensberg Road, you can actually go and look and see exactly where we're driving. Torchwood, not yet. It's got the roads, but it doesn't have the numbers, the names. Hmm. Jansen, this is a unique feature of this wonderful uh, vehicle known as the Land Rover Defender. Uh, the wheel turns so much because what is known as a steering box, I don't know what that is, it's a box that just has something to do with the steering inside, is, um, well, shall we say, temperamental to say the best so you can see that when I do this the car hardly moves but if I drive in a straight line what you'll notice is that the car will suddenly start turning one direction there we go we're now going off to the left so it does its own thing and that's why it looks like we're moving all over the place the actual fact that a straight line is driven with the steering wheel at that angle there I don't really understand Don't know. Sorry about that. Yes, there are Tundi's tracks. That's not Tundi's tracks, that's a male. There's a male leopard going down this road as well. Ah, they found a young male leopard just down here. I'm on my way. Where's my game drive radio? I'm on my way. Just down here. The male at the end of these tracks. Hold on, Craig. Don't go anywhere. I'm going to finally give you something to film. Big bump. Turn up the game drive radio. Woo! A four wheel drift, it's always quite fun. Now, if it's a young male leopard, could it possibly be the magical Hosanna back from the west? Could it be Tamba back from the southeast? Next road junction 
legs where he should be. Nearly there, everybody. Stay with me. No, I can't hear you. Sorry, Kirsten, I'm going to turn you down so I can hear Aubrey. Orbs, go again. It's Hosanna. I'll be um, one minute from Junction Batelier. Haha, <laughs> that's very exciting. Here he is. <laughs> Isn't this marvellous? What a stroke of luck. Can you see him? This one. Next one. Now, oh, there he is, on the ground, either eating something or his own foot. That's wonderful. Thanks, Orbs. There he is, everybody. He's back home. Tingana. Oh, it's not Osana, it's Tingana, everybody. It's all right. That'll do. Doesn't matter. A slight anticlimax. But it's still nice to have him. I thought those tracks looked a little bit large, myself. Hello, fellow. Now, we had those male leopard tracks. You know what Herbert said last yesterday? He said he thought this cat was around here somewhere. And his teeth are in fantastic shape for a lift of his age. Nothing wrong with his chompers. He's obviously paid a great deal of attention to keeping them clean. He's had good dentist work done. Hello, old boy. business as cat now. He's looking in superb nick. Sleek and muscled and absolutely fine. Right, well, we'll follow him down the road, I think. I'll just let Aubrey get out of the way by getting out of his way. Now what we'll do is we'll alternate as we go down the road, everyone. So he'll go in front, then I'll we'll go in front, then he'll go in front. Carry on, Orbs. It's calling again. In Gorm. I'm going to go past. Magic. He's just sniffing some elephant dung there. I'm not sure why. Somebody's obviously marked there. I suspect Hundy. He was around here earlier. Special. I'm thinking of trying to get around the front of him. Okay, while we do that, Ralph Kirsten has managed to find his first big tortured cat.
Well, everyone here, these female lions, they just um, started walking towards us uh, through the block. I am not sure which group or which pride these lions are from. I am thinking that it's maybe the Nkuhumas, but I have no idea just yet. We've just seen some lions. That's all I know. So we'll just wait and see once we can get them a little bit closer. They were mobile towards us. Now they've just gone down. So I'm just waiting a little while before I go rushing in there. And then they walk back up towards us where we are anyway. So that's why I'm just staying stationary for the minute. We just let them do their thing as they were on the move. We saw three of them. I'm pretty sure there are some more moving through the bushes but there's one that we can see and it's funny they walked and then they just lay down all of a sudden but they are still awake and looking like they might get up again so let's just wait a little bit and if they don't move then obviously I will go in a bit closer and get a better view I just want to wait and see what they get up to for the time being so yes the first lions on Torchwood They're looking around, maybe we'll even get a hunt, who knows? It's the perfect time of day, there's still lots of light. And it's getting nice and cool, and they're nice and alert. So it looks like chasing flies there a little bit. This female in particular, she looks like she's got quite uh, well-rounded ears there, no real nicks. Well, cuts in them to talk of. She looks like a good looking female that. Perfectly camouflaged in the long grass. Looking south towards us. Giraffe girl asking if it could be the Torchwood Pride. Um, I'm sure it could be Giraffe girl. Uh, we'll have to wait and see and get a little bit closer on the on the identification so absolutely it could be the Torchwood Pride um, or the Nkumas could quite easily be the Torchwood Pride yes I don't think I've seen them before so it will be nice to see them wonderful new place new pride of lions possibly I like it. Oh, there's another one just underneath that silver cluster leaf. Mm. Harvey on the left. That's where that one went down there. She's just picked her head up. There she is. And oh, there's, they're running now. There's some running towards them. Just come in. There we are. And I can hear some contact calling going on as well. Ah, oh, awesome. Looks like a young male, sub-adult. Here they come, perfect. And I wasn't even trying to be punny. <laughs> so the contact, I wonder what's been going on. They look like they're waking up after their day's sleep. Lots of yawning, a little bit of energy. And there is all sorts of little contact calls going on. Oh, it sounds like there's more coming. Okay, I think I'm just going to get a little bit closer in here, Darby. This is a bit frustrating that we're not really seeing much. Being a little bit far. Let's just get a clearer view. I'm just going to shift. But we can see them nicely. Because there's all sorts. Yeah, they come running in. Okay, so I'm going to get in here a little bit closer and, and uh, we'll get a perfect view. But let's send you off to James. It seems Tingana's on the move. Tingana is on the move. He's on the move about two feet from where I'm sitting. Hello, Tingana. Nice to see you. <laughs> you are a magical cat. Ah, look at him. <laughs> Oh, he is just depositing some popcorn. There we go. A very abstemious deposit he made.
shawl. We're just going to let Aubrey go past. I did a whole special bundu bash to try and get round in front of him, and then he lay down in the road. All righty, the lions at Ralph's got an eye on the move, so let's go back to them. <laughs> As that one has just disappeared behind the bushes, uh, but we've got lots of stuff happening in front here. This is awesome. There's a couple of little sub-adults there, cubs. Yeah, so I don't think that this is the Nkahumas. I think it must then be the Torchwood Pride. Um, and they look rather skinny, so they would be well worth watching because I, I think there could be a hunt on the cards here this evening. Might only happen much later, but they are definitely hungry cats. And there's all sorts. I haven't counted how many. There was one that just came past us now. And then there's two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's at least ten. There's eleven. And that's no, twelve, thirteen. So definitely not the Unkohumas. It's a bigger pride than that. There's lots of them around here. All sorts happening. Well, Minamu, that's a very good question. Why don't males develop um, a, a dew lap? It seems, uh, it seems like the leopards are pretty much the only ones that really pick up that out of the cats. Um, the males obviously, oh, look at that one, right next to that car as he's sharpening his nails. Um, the males, uh, lions, um, well, they've got that big mane and you wouldn't really be able to see it even if they did get a dew lap. Um, so potentially when, a, when the old males get older um, and into their latter years, they potentially would or could have a dewlap, but we don't even see it. Um, but it does seem to be reasonably unique to the leopards. I haven't seen it on any other cats, never seen it on any of the females either. You know, when they do get a bit older, they can get a bit of loose skin and so on. Ah, so everyone agreeing that this is the Torchwood Pride? Thanks guys for helping out. I was pretty sure that with these numbers that definitely not doing Kahuma, so leading to the Torchwood Pride as that one was just having a little bit of a sharpening session. There's a couple of vehicles in the area here. We're on a, there's three vehicles here now, so that's the max that we would have. All the guests also enjoying the sighting as well. Perfect timing, these uh, lines just becoming active now. A couple of youngsters around, so there'll be fun and games. A bit of tackling and chasing each other around. And that's why I say we've all positioned in different spots here. The one lion has come up and lay down in a bush just next to us, but we can't see her. And so I'm not going to move just yet. Just wait a little bit and see what happens, otherwise I'll try to get us a nice view. Oh, okay, well, we'll wait and see what happens with these lions, but uh, James got uh, Tingana walking down the road. He's still coming. We've just got into a beautiful position. We're now on our own with him. Hello, fellow. Beautiful. He's being s serious about his calling. He's walking along here making a big noise. A tattered ear. Speaking of a potential fight at some stage of his life. I wonder if Tundi is not around here somewhere, and that's not what he's smelling. Becky, this is a very subjective thing to answer. I think Tingana is heavier, uh, no, slightly taller, but the same sort of thickness as Hukumuri. 
Kukumuri to me is, is not a large leopard, he's a small leopard, and I think, well, I mean relatively, and I reckon that Tingana is about an average sized male. He's a good size, but he's not as big as the Anderson male, and he's slightly bigger than Mvula was. And the average male mass in this area is 63 kilograms, so about 130 pounds, 140 pounds. Let me move around the front of him. Oh, sorry about that. The piece of bush, sorry boy. He's got up because of me. I'm sorry about that. He also got up because there's so much bush that I can't turn around. Okay, through here. Need to turn the game drive radio up. Okay, we're going to keep up with him. Let's go back to the lions. All right, here we go, everyone. Uh, it seems the lions haven't moved too much, so we've still got a very good view. There is a very pretty female there. But as I said, they're looking quite skinny and every potential that we might get lucky in watching them do a bit of hunting. And quite nice show on Torchwood that it is reasonably open. Although in this particular area that we're in is uh, a little bit of a drainage line that the lines have come out of. So quite thick down there. But as we move away, then it becomes a bit more open. So you could see them a little bit easier than in some parts where it's very thick especially on Juma and there's all sorts of little contact calls going on with them down there <laughs> little moans and groans and ow grrr. now so you can tell um, Females will also mark territory, yes. They they will also be moving around um, and on their patrols they do spray on all the bushes next to the road and any prominent features and each one piles past and goes and sprays. Um, so yes, they will also be marking that particular area of theirs out uh, with lots of spraying, and like a group of this. Um, it's quite... Um, uh, sort of a, a traditional or uh, like a routine and they'll walk around the particular territory and then each one will walk past and have to spray on a little bush that they've uh, designated as the, the spraying bush and then they move on again and then they, you know, any of the little prominent features. And one of the females keeps sneezing just off from us here. Uh, not that one, yeah. Not that one's overlooking. Ooh. A bit of movement here. Okay, I think I might because they're on the road now, Davi. So I'm gonna just reverse. Looks like they're playing on the road there. So if I reverse, we might get a nice view of them on the road here. Oh, there we go, and they're playing. Perfect. That's what we want to see. Come on. Show us your rugby skills, good tackles and wrestling match. Here we go. Game's on. Look how they're smacking each other. <laughs> oh, youngsters. <laughs> and they a little bit of calling as well. Ooh. What's going to happen next? It's awesome when you've got a, a big pride of lions like this and there's all sorts going on. There's some more making their way towards the road where these two are. That one looks like it's got a big growth behind the back of its leg. Did you see that, Davy? Mm -hmm. Just before it went down there, it had like on its elbow, it had a real big bullocky on the back there. Okay, I'm going to see if we just can get a better view here. Um, but let's head you on to the bushwalk team. I wonder how they're going. It's, it's, uh, it's getting quite dark now. Shh. <laughs> 
I've never scaled a tree so quickly in my life. But Ferg looked at me and said, do you want to climb a tree? And I went, okay. I don't say no to a challenge. Should we up on the tree? Hey? It's not very stable, though. It's an old tree. I think it's an old... Herbie, what do you think? This is an obthorn, eh? Old knobthorn, yeah. I was looking at the bark. Good view from up here, though. Really good view. You can actually start seeing down and sort of through the trees now into little open pockets of grass, which helps a lot. Sorry? Oh, this is the second time. I don't know if I can... No, I don't want to let go. Once... Sebastian made me holding the moon, but that I was also standing on the car and it was flat, so I don't think I'll be doing that. Remember, we did that in the Mulwati. It was quite cool. I was wondering, Ferg was pointing, and I was like, what do you see, Ferg? I was like, oh, yeah, that big thing up there. Okay, I'm probably going to come down now, I think. I think this is what we're going to do. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Don't, no one jinx me. Don't say anything. Kirsty's just said, McTumble, how will you feel, Kirsten, if I really, how bad will you feel if I really hurt myself now? Yeah, let the guilt set in. <laughs> yeah, easy peasy. That wasn't so bad. This is James's tree, by the way. I've stolen it from him. He normally likes to climb it at the back of the tent. And we've been creeping closer to home because that herd of elephants were moving on in and it's starting to get dark. Right now... Apparently there's a, somebody else out here who's better climbing down and up trees. Well, I suppose that's Tingana. I'm not sure what that meant, but we're still with Tingana. He's making wee-wees on lots of bushes. The popcorn scent all around us is fantastic. And it smells a little bit like being at the bioscope. Go ahead, I'm just on the game drive radio. Yeah, probably he's going into the Mlamati now at Batalia. Mm, very strong smell of popcorn there. Did you get that? For those of you who are wondering what are we talking about, it is, of course, the fact that uh, leopard's urine smells like popcorn. Satisfaction? I have not witnessed a leopard fight. I have witnessed many leopard standoffs, but I have not got any... I've never seen a, a fight between two male leopards. It's so rare. The negative, you will not interfere. You do see it from time to time. It has happened. But it is not, they will try and avoid it. Try and settle their differences with growling and negotiation before war takes place. You can imagine the damage the two leopards with that kind of strength and speed could do to each other. I can't really get round the front of him over here. I probably could actually. Let me try. Sorry about that, Craig. I dumped you in the dwang there. We're supposed to just touch the key lightly so that the cameraman knows to zoom out rather than just firing it up. little cough before he starts. He goes... <laughs> I also seldom seen a leopard calling this frequently. He's very clearly in the mood to restake himself. Samuel, age nine, 
they saw like this to say to announce their presence to mark territory for the same reason that he's urinating on the side of the road he's trying to announce to any other leopards that this is his place and that nobody else must be in his way so that's why he's calling and he does it by basically doing what I was doing <laughs> but his voice box Instead of being fixed in his neck, it rattles and moves up and down. And that's how he's able to make such a noise. Mm. No, chaps, I'm sorry. We're going to have to just be patient and sit with him on the road. There's far too much bush in here. Sorry about that. I believe old T-Bomb has made it home to my, well, one of my favourite locations on this reserve. next to the tent <laughs> we're still around here we've been pottering around having a look for things but it's been fairly quiet as i think all the warthogs have decided to go to sleep the butterflies have settled in for the evening and well i've already heard part of the evening chorus by the birds so <clears throat> in true fashion of course as the sun starts to go down in the afternoon we can't stay out on foot as uh, well the tables turn and we might get eaten although we probably wouldn't be able to see where we were going firstly unless we were walking with big torches and that wouldn't be a particularly fun experience so we won't be doing anything like that we will probably be retiring to the DRC which is not far away it's literally 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 just behind us goodness gracious anyways it's been a fun afternoon not much out there in terms of little insects and things that were too quick for us this afternoon but they should be frozen again tomorrow morning so for myself ferg and herbie we hope you have a wonderful evening and while the bushwalk team will see you bright and early tomorrow we've just got around him so he's going to come wandering past us now and then we will see the rear end of Tingana once again. Just listening to see if he can hear any other leopards calling. Perhaps he'd like to see his daughter, Tlalamba. Oh, he's dribbling. That normally means, or it can often mean, that he's sensed the presence of another male and is kind of preparing for a standoff. I think they do, Jens. I think they appreciate the road a lot because especially this time of the year when the grass is so long it's difficult for them to see and they obviously don't like getting wet in the mornings especially in the cold mornings so in much the same way as they'll use elephant and hippo paths to move so they'll use the roads that we produce going to gently ease down the road. It's getting cooler now. I think his sound will travel even further in the cooler air. Oh, yeah, and a bit of quarry marking. Sorry, Bull Rev, I missed your question. Look at the aim he's got. That is truly impressive. Yes, Bull Rev, they do saw as well, females. That's how they mark their territories. Some people will tell you that they can tell the difference between male and female roaring or sawing. I can't tell the difference. <laughs> It's just starting to echo now off the thicker trees on the banks of the Umarawamati River. And 
really, I mean, the popcorn smell is quite overpowering sometimes. He will urinate on a bush like that, on that guari bush, because nothing will eat it. Davy, not that I've heard. I mean, obviously my ears aren't anything like as sharp as his, but I haven't heard any response to his calling. But this will be gathering attention. I mean, he's being serious about this. This is not perfunctory. This is a real announcement. I don't know if Hukumuri has been this far towards the east. I don't think he has. And stuck. There's a water buck watching him. He's paying no heed to the water buck whatsoever. Now the monkeys are calling. Those monkeys have seen him from a good, I'd say, 80 to 100 meters in the fading light. And he doesn't care. There he is doing his thing in the bush there. This is classic leopard marking behavior. Rubbing his scent all over that bush. Yeah, no, they're not that far away. They're about 40 meters away in the tops of the trees. We won't show you them to you simply because I want to stay with him. I don't want to lose them or lose him. I suppose we could have a quick look, Craig. Let's have a quick look over there in the leadwood. Fluffy Ossicone, beautiful name you have there. Unlike the... Well, in fact, quite similarly to most mammal species, actually, age does not affect their fertility too much. So they will be able to produce offspring until the day they die. In theory, so could most uh, human beings, for example. They don't go through a period of infertility. Obviously, you get slightly less fertile as you get older. But it doesn't, that doesn't apply to the leopards. They will be fertile until the day that they die. Interestingly, though, when he... When we last watched him mating with Karula to produce Hosanna and Shongile, I'm going to have to drive around the other side, everyone. Uh, he and Karula took six, at least six matings before she fell pregnant and produced Shongile and Hosanna. Hold on. There he goes. I'm just going to quickly tell, say where he is. Oh, no, it's not going to work. Stations Tingana now mobile north up towards the junction of Vulture's Nest and Nyala Road South. Where are you? Now yeah, come down into the drainage and then come up towards Nyal Road South. Just helping someone else get into the sighting. He asked me which way he should come, but I didn't know where he was, so I couldn't tell him. Ooh, no, this is going to get tricky. Definitely, Judy, uh, no, it doesn't tell him, that, tell him that he wants to mate. It tells females that he's around. Judy, if you've ever watched leopards mate, it's the females that find the males, and then they harass them, basically, until they mate with them. But they do not go seeking mating opportunities normally, the males.
we're just going to let this other fellow in. All right, Ralph has left Torchwood. Let's go back and find where he's going to adventure now. Well, everyone, um, unfortunately, we did have to leave that uh, group of lions because, um, you know, there are some rules that uh, I'm sure James explained to you the other day, but there were quite a lot of uh, people interested in coming to see those lions. So luckily we did have a nice view on them, and um, uh, well, we did have to make our uh, exit because of that. So I'm sure we're going to be able to go in there again, uh, but there was just lots of interest because of those particular lions there. So. Unfortunately, we had to leave, but fortunately, we were allowed to go in there in the first place. So we'll take that one, we'll stick it in the bank, and we'll go back again, uh, I think maybe even tomorrow or the next day. But for now, we're back at Twin Dams, and I'm going to just pop, pop my nose in here and see what's hanging around, have a quick squiz, see what is here, if anything, and then we'll head up to treehouse dam see what's up that way and as you saw I'm getting it's getting rather chilly at this uh, time of year and this time of the evening especially when you drive with a little bit of air flowing through let's just have a quick look over here it's a very pretty evening with the with the light there and the reflections let's take all the lights off that's very pretty it's like a mill pond. Beautiful light. I can hear a little barred owlet calling behind us. Do, 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 do. And there's all sorts of just the last little bits of the day birds calling. Little Franklin and Spurfowl having their last little say before the night really is upon us. Beautiful with that reflection of the trees there as well. That is spectacular. I'm sure we're going to start hearing the whooping of the hyenas quite soon. What a perfect way to end the day with that kind of light. Nothing in the way of animals really, but it's just a stunning scenery and a perfect shot. All right. Perfect. Thanks, Darby. That's brilliant camera work there. Let's head on a little bit further. Let's see if we can find... Oh, Ray, you want me to find some more bush babies. Now, I think last night was probably my bush baby for the year uh, with that way that it's a sat like that perfectly, but I'm definitely going to try again. Uh, just up from us here is where uh, Janet... Is it Janet Jackson? Janet, Janet Jackson <laughs> hangs out. So maybe let's have a look. Maybe, I don't know if it's a male or female. I've just seen the, the little stripes of the, of the Janet in the hollow tree. I'll have a look there and see if that, if he's, um, if he's active, he or she. I'm not quite sure if it's a male or female. So we'll stop there. And then, uh, and then I'll go and drive all those little roads around uh, Treehouse Dam. There's um, Savages Track and Shabamu and those little roads, which is, uh, what are we here, on the southern boundary. And there's some nice little roads there. I've, uh, I've seen Tingana there before. I've also seen Hosanna. I know that James is, is with Tingana now. Um, but leopards do like moving in this area and the Unkuhumas were here as well the other day when I uh, caught up with them on foot that's the Unkuhuma lion pride and the elephant carcass is just off to our sort of northwest now um, so yeah it's, anything's possible in this area right it seems like uh, Tingana's got himself quite thirsty so let's go off to him He certainly has, and he'll probably drink for quite some time now. Leopards, although, as I've said before, are independent of water largely, they do very much enjoy a drink, especially on a Sunday evening, you know, after a hard week of sawing and making a noise. He keeps hearing something, he keeps hearing bits and pieces moving around. Oh, it's an elephant. 
it's a thing that we can't speak about coming towards the waterhole. Sorry, I became overexcited. He's going to move off. You can see we had that chat a little bit earlier about their ability to orientate themselves. And you can see he knows this area completely perfectly. He knows exactly where the water is. There he is. Doing a little bit more marking. And he will now probably follow this game path. It's my favorite game path. It goes all the way up to that little pan where I started yesterday's Safari Lives show. I'm not sure if you were watching or not. And then he will probably fetch up at Wuyatela Dam. Ralph, cheetah planes come in. <laughs> Ralph is also seeking popcorn, but of a different kind. Ralph is on the... Well, everyone, I've come here to this little house of Janet Jackson, and when we arrived, I was looking in this bottom hole there, and there were two individuals. So now going up a little bit further, I can just see the little spots over there. But they've obviously just got a little bit of a fright with the, with the sound of the vehicle. So I just want to sit here uh, for a little bit. They can hear me talking now, so I don't know if they're going to show themselves. I can see the spots from this angle. I don't know if you'll be able to from that angle. And there you can see a bit of movement. There you can see the tail going up. So this tree is totally um, hollow and they've moved up in that tree, I think probably into about that area now. Um, but very safe inside there, I would say. But uh, at the moment, we're not getting a really good visual on them. So we'll have to maybe just wait a little bit. We'll see if they pop their heads out. Otherwise, we'll leave them be and we'll move along because it is about time for them to start coming out. And I don't want to stop them because we're just sitting here at the front door and not allowing them out. I just want to see if they show us their heads. They might have to be a little bit quiet for a while and then they'll have to calm down. It's a little bit like the mongoose where you go quiet and then they start to relax with your presence and come out. But Obviously, Janets are quite shy, so I wouldn't be surprised if they don't show themselves while we're here. So it might be that they are a little bit camera shy. <laughs> I could still make out a little bit of a movement in the top hole there, but they're right up inside. You're not going to show us? All right, shame. I think we're going to leave them. They're a little bit too shy for us. We'll have to come back again. We'll have to habituate them to the vehicle and let them know that we're not going to hurt them. And if we come here every evening or, you know, come here regularly, they might uh, relax with the presence of the vehicle if they know that we're not going to hurt them. But uh, for now, they're too nervous, so we'll move along. And so from one little cat-like species, not quite a cat, these guys are part of the Mustelli day and the Pesti day, they're sort of mixed now, but uh, let's go to another cat with spots. Well, there he is, still marking along. I thought he'd go into some thicker bush. I'm just going to give Ralph the opportunity to go past him. This is another Ralph who's working with Cheetah Plains. Carry on, buddy, because we've had him in front. I'm not sure how they're looking at him, but they're being very, very gracious by not spotlighting him while we've got our infrared light on. I mean, it's almost pitch black out here now. Oh, so we won't get a great view for a little while. There goes the spotlight.
W. James, his offspring. We tend to think so much of the female's offspring. Have they survived to adulthood? Well, Hosanna's got pretty close. Tumba's got pretty close. Uh, they both sort of, I mean, Hosanna's two and a half, just about. I'm just going to stop here. Um, Tumba is about two. Uh, I'm trying to think who else there was. I don't know. Who else is his offspring? I'm trying to think. No, you know what? I wonder. Certainly none of Tundi's, had not Tundi's Shadow's cubs made it, that he sired. Who else would he have sired cubs with? He could have sired cubs uh, with some of the leopards in Buffalo's Hook. But it's very difficult to know what's going on there. It's a really good question. Sindile, possibly, he was Shadow's one cub that may have made it to adulthood, dispersed. As I said earlier, he went into rehab for rabies, and he could have survived to adulthood. He might still be alive somewhere, just having dispersed somewhere else. <laughs> I, I mean, I hate to think that there weren't any. And um, we don't know all of his offspring, of course, because females will come out of their territories to mate with males. I'm sorry we don't have a view, everybody. We will eventually. There's just a very thick bush here, and so it's very hard for Ralph to get out of the way. All righty. We'll keep following. Let's go back across to Ralph, who doesn't have a large cruiser in front of him. Well, and we are just also looking for any little nighttime critters. I'm trying to see if I can find a chameleon. Come, 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 chameleon. Or a bush baby, or a genet, or a civet, or a white-tailed mongoose, or a porcupine, or even a loose cannon leopard. Why not? Ryan, uh, that's a good question. Thanks for asking that. Um, and now I'm not quite sure. But I think the most amazing thing about my job is like I was talking about earlier, the randomness. Because you can come out and drive every single day and you never know what you're going to see. Like, you know, I think that is the best thing about my job, the total randomness of it. I know I'm going to be driving a vehicle or, or I'm going to be walking in the bush, but I never know what the bush is going to throw at me. So I think I would say that's the best part. Random. Total randomness, as we were talking about it earlier. And uh, I like to mix it up, so and that just keeps the work exciting because you never know what you're going to get. Old Forrest Gump saying, hey, box of chocolates. What you going to get next? And exactly like what we're doing now, what are we going to find? Is it going to be an elephant that has attacked a rhino or a black-backed jackal that's um, fighting with a civet? Well, we don't have to have everything fighting. Maybe we'll have a impala that... Um, has made friends with a water buck. Oh, Kirsten says a honey badger giving birth. That would be a good one. What about um, an owl digging up a dung beetle nest? That would be random. What about a bat that's eating a baboon spider? That would be cool. What else? There's a water hole just here. We're heading now down towards Treehouse Dam, but there's nothing down by this little pan over here. I've just come past where I found the Unkuhumas the other morning on foot. No sign of them as of yet. I heard that they moved down onto Arethusa. Oh, there was a random mouse that ran across the road. And speaking of uh, running on the road, it seems Tingana is back on his. He is, as is uh, Ralph. We had a nice view. Anyway, he'll move into an open area shortly. 
No, no, Kirsten, I'm afraid you can't. We're just discussing how Kirsten's timing has been, um, well, from the top drawer as far as this sighting's gone. <laughs> what I should have done was actually left, um, I should have just left him in front until we wanted to link. Anyway, he's going to get out of this vast forest around us eventually and then we'll both be able to look at him. So, send through any questions you have about Tingana and we'll do our level best to answer them. Has anybody come up with an answer as to whether he, he has a known offspring of adult age or independence? I would feel dreadfully sad if he didn't. Sky, I don't, absolutely. I don't know that I, Tingana didn't mate with somebody before I showed up on Juma. He must have. He would have been a nine-year-old male. I just don't know who, and I don't know what the progeny were. None of the youngsters that were around when I was here, though, were his because we were largely, of course, with Mpula's youngsters. And I suppose the interesting part about that is that his territory definitely shifted as Mpula's power waned. And so he could easily have... I wonder if he didn't mate with Nkanyeni, perhaps, in the east. He could have mated... In fact, remember, he used to... He must have mated with... Uh, he could have mated with Salayeshe, you know to produce Tiani. I'm sure everyone reckons the Anderson male is Tiani's fa uh, father. But, you know, he used to go all the way onto the Elephant Plains boundary, which is way west of here. And that encompassed Shadow's territory. It encompassed Sarayesha's territory. She was a famous leopard from Sumbambili. And her latest independent offspring is Tiani, who's just been mating with the Hukumuri male. She could easily have mated with, he could have mated with Quatile, who is since deceased. She had three cubs that died with her death. But I don't know what happened after that, or before that. So yeah, I mean, there could easily be some that we just don't know about. There's a young female who comes on to Ch Chitra Chitra called Sibui. Um, could be his. It's hard to believe that a grizzled fellow like this who has done you know, so much to get to this time of his life has not got one independent offspring. Let's see if we can't get a decent shot of him. Riandi Guchava is in fact Mvula's offspring, not Tinganas, we're pretty sure. In fact, I wonder if Kuchava wasn't Mbula's last offspring. Paula, we do need a leopard flowchart, and in fact, we're getting close to having one um, on our website. Eventually, we will have one. But if you go to the website, it does tell you who's female is, or who belongs to who, pretty much. Not in a chart, but it does tell you who belongs to who. Okay, back on the road here. We can try and get around him eventually. There's a little bit of a road coming up. We might try and get past him. Okay, the reason we can't see him is that Craig can't put the infrared light on my, the back of my head because you'll be completely blinded by the glow. It's got nothing to do with any deficiency in my head, but rather the power of the infrared light. So it's either me or the animal and what we don't like to do is have the picture jumping up and down, so, which is what happens if he zooms in too much on the animal. Okay, I think we're going to have to give these other chaps a turn. Well, that's a nice picture of him. And so in the meantime, let's go across to Random Ralphie. Yep, Random Ralph. It's better than Wreckage Ralph, I'd say. Um, yeah, we still haven't found anything too random this yet. Lots of little mothies and butterflies. 
not butterflies really, I think they're more so moths flying up. We've seen the odd scrub here, the ever present scrub here, which could, um, like I say, form a lot of these um, predators that are struggling, whether they're being chased by other males or anything else. Geesh, if I was a lion that was being chased by other lions, I'll just have my little snacks of scrub hairs to keep myself sustained. But, uh, well, that's me and I can think like a human and it's not as easy uh, if you're being hounded by other males and so I don't think uh, it's going to be as easy as that. I'm just thinking back to that to that uh, lion that was spotted here the other day. Look, oh, sorry buddy. Fish, that was pretty random. We're in a herd of elephants here. I'm just going to turn these lights off. Okay, we're just going to go to infrared because elephants do not like lights. There we are. Sorry about that, guys. I got a, just as much as a, a fright as you did. There we are. And we're right in a group of these elephants here. I don't mean any harm, and I'm sure you don't either. There we are. Carry on your feeding. As they are, you can hear them feeding. Look at that. Wonderful. So, you speak of randomness and it uh, comes to find you. Very pretty elephants here. Yeah? I can only hear them and watch them on the screen in the infrared. Because uh, in the darkness here, yeah, I can't see them at all. It's lovely to watch them on the infrared. Because in this kind of situation with guests per se, I would probably not stay here at all because I won't put a torch on them, they really don't like it and they can get quite agitated with you putting a torch on them and um, well in the dark I don't quite know what they're up to. So it is actually ideal and very special that we get to sit watching elephants uh, in infrared because not your, your average guest won't get to see this in the dark. So we actually get to see them outside of normal game watching times. That's fascinating. Now Leah, thanks for saying that. Yeah, I feel it is pretty awesome. These elephants are all around us. Everybody very relaxed. They're carrying on their feeding. And I love elephants. Uh, it's one of my favorite things in the world ever to be doing. It's just to be in the presence of elephants. It's such a calming feeling, just being around them. Yes, sometimes they can have different moods and it can be a little bit edgy sometimes, but uh, on the whole, it's pretty much like this. Look at this one, having a little sniff at us, I think. Also, not the greatest night vision. Okay, so, we've had a lovely little uh, sighting with these elephants in the dark, but I think let's leave them alone for now and send you to the nocturnal animal, which is uh, Tingana. Tingana has found what Ralph has found. Uh, he's lying down now because there's a herd of elephants in front of him. And it's so funny to watch his reaction. He's reacted very much like we would. He's kind of stopped dead in the road and looked interested but then also as though he's looked the same as us on our way back for breakfast for example when we think we're almost home and then we're blocked by a herd of elephants and he kind of looks disappointed he was standing there looking from side to side thinking how can I possibly get around them without them seeing me as they will take great displeasure at having him walking in the middle of the herd Gonna try. Yeah, we've got one minute left, everybody. Let's keep going. I suspect this poor fellow behind us is going to need a bit of a chance in front, so I'm gonna have to let him try. We'll go around this way. also want to go running into the elephants. All right, yeah, everyone, I think that's going to be 
probably the last we see of the young Tingis. There he is in front of us. We can have one last look as he disappears into the darkness. Thank you very much for joining us on the Sunday Sunset Safari. We will, of course, see you tomorrow at 06.30. Uh, huge thanks for your contributions, your questions and comments. I feel I don't say that quite enough, so thank you very much for those. We will see you tomorrow morning. Until then, bye-bye.